Okay, I'm going to call the August or October 11th committee the whole meeting to order. I'm looking for an adoption of the agenda. Mr. Mayor, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, and then looking for adoption of the previous minutes from September 13th in full. Everyone's seen it. Any errors or omissions? I'll move the minutes as presented. Okay, Councilor Persichny, all those in favor? Carried. We have no reports in the office, and we're moving on to D2 infrastructure and planning uh, bylaw rewrite. And Chris and company, you could approach the table, and we look forward to your presentation. Just as a bit of an intro while we're getting the presentation up and running. Um, we want to introduce ourselves, Urban Systems. We've been working on the land use bylaw for a while. <laughs> the better part <laughs> is here. Uh, it's great to be here with you in person. I know we kicked this off. We were just small boxes on a TV screen, uh, mm -hmm. but we had a great opportunity to be in the community in April talking to a whole bunch of folks about the project itself. Great to be here again with you in person and back in the community again today. So just as a, as a brief introduction to my role generally on the project, um, just for your benefit, I'm the one in the top right-hand corner. That's me. <laughs> so I was like a bit for me, right? Me. That was especially for me, so I wouldn't forget your name. Just make sure you're making sure. We all look alike. So. Uh, playing a bit of an advisory role, so I do a lot of work with local government on the connections between some of the policy and some of the regulatory side of things. So I tend to work much more up in the clouds, and the brains here tend their knee down to the ground when we actually start to talk about the rules. Uh, so that's in a nutshell. Uh, where we're here today is just to give you a bit of an update on where the project's at. So we, we kicked this off with you. We went and had a whole bunch of conversations with staff. We had a whole bunch of conversations in the community. We did a whole bunch of, of research and our own learning on where things are at with your previous bylaw, how it connects to some of your other plans, what are some of the issues in the community. And today we wanted to come back as part of that feedback loop as to here's where we're at now. And so we want to present today what we're calling essentially a 50% draft. So we've taken all of the information to date, synthesized that into a general direction and structure of where we want the bylaw to go. And I'll talk a little bit more at the end about where we're going from here. But from that, I'll turn it over. Maybe Dana, if you want to introduce yourself and we'll, we'll go through all the faces up there. For sure, thanks Chris. I'm Dana Mears. Um, with this project, I'm the engagement specialist, so helping to coordinate all communications with public and with businesses, and just getting the word out about this project, really. I'll pass it over to Becky. Hi, I'm Becky Sobe, a project planner on this project. I've been lucky enough in my career to work with primarily local uh, governments and smaller communities, and yeah, Jennifer and I both tend to nerd out on this bylaw stuff. So keen and happy in that. Yeah, you see us doing a little wiggle. That's because we're happy to be here. Jennifer, you're up. Uh, my name is Jennifer Clett. I'll be the one doing a lot of wiggling. Uh, <laughs> my background is in local government and being part of administration. I have quite a bit of experience in land use bylaws. So that's why I get a little of Becky was being kind of noxiously excited about bylaws. Um, so today we're going to really at a high level talk about the guiding principles that we introduced to the last time we were here and the little boxes on your screen. Um, but in the interest of time, we're going to kind of cruise past that. Uh, we'll give you an overview of what we've done to date. Um, and then Becky and I will kind of run through the 50% uh, land use bylaw draft and the approach of that, that strategy and why, um, why we've taken it. And then Chris will summarize up with some next steps and when you're going to see us again. Um, so we talked last time a bit about guiding principles and really the intent around the guiding principle is to help the project team uh, be very intentional when we're drafting or coming up with different approaches that it's, it's coming from uh, a set of, of principles um, that help to guide us. Um, next step. 
So uh, we have quite a few of those. One is to increase flexibility, which is, is really important, especially in a bylaw setting that can be really, really, really restrictive. Um, also to make sure that they're simple, concise, and purposeful. Sometimes it feels like provisions are there for absolutely no reason. So we wanna make sure that they actually serve some sort of function. Um, that a bylaw is clear and easy to interpret. It's really easy to bring out the lawyer jargon uh, and get lost amongst all the words. We wanna make sure that it's actually easy to understand. Uh, an element of being visually pleasing and user-friendly. So understanding that the members of your community are also gonna interact with this document as well as planners. So making sure that everybody can kind of come to common place with the document and, and understand it in a pretty clear way. Um, also, a main function of a bylaw is to regulate. So we want to make sure that it's actually enforceable and that's not uh, just there to take up some space on your shelf. Um, also, that it follows best practice. So making sure that it's actually legally applicable um, and, that, uh, and that there's some industry standards that we're following. And, uh, keeping in line with best practices, but at the same time, not taking something from like new urbanism in Florida and applying it to Edson where trees don't all grow the same. Uh, so make sure that we're reflecting the local context. And that, of course, they, it aligns with your higher order documents. Align use bylaw, we talked about this before, is really where the rubber hits the road. It's your implementation document. So if it's not implementing your higher order documents, it's really not doing its job. Next. Okay. So uh, Chris alluded to some of the work that we've done previously. So I'm just gonna walk you through uh, exactly what those steps look like. So we started with the background analysis, which was a pretty intensive review of the land use file itself, rent back, sort of understanding those gaps, but also the opportunities for rethinking the way that we write our bylaw. Uh, that also included interviews with staff, because as we know, these people are in the bylaw every single day. They know exactly where those gaps are. Um, and some of the needs in, in doing a rewrite. Uh, and then as Jennifer mentioned, also making sure that we're looking at the relevant town um, plan documents. Uh, next, we did a best and we're calling it best slash common practice review. And, and the reason for that is uh, it's one thing to, you know, gather a bunch of comparable municipalities, look at their land use file and sort of understand what are, what's out there. Uh, but for us, it, it was important that we're rooting that in what's best for Edson. So making sure that we have that extra layer and that lens that when looking and saying, okay, just because these six do it the same way, does that mean that it's going to work for Edson? Uh, so that was sort of an important way to approach that step. Uh, and then Dane is going to take us through a quick uh, overview of the engagement that's been done so far. Yeah, so back in April, we came up for the um, Edson Chamber of Commerce trade show. And we were able to connect with a lot of people through that way. Um, and we met a lot of you there as well. Uh, we also had some pop-up booths at grocery stores and other po uh, popular venues. We connected with the business community virtually and in person. And in total, we heard from over 130 people, which is pretty exciting for a land use bylaw. So we're hoping to build on this success moving forward. Um, a lot of what we heard from engagement number one was about interests, uh, interesting topics like driveways, parking issues, um, interest in home-based businesses and other things that they'll cover more in detail of that spectacular key. So for the 50% draft, uh, the, the purpose of really calling it a 50% and, and stopping and pausing at this phase is to allow more of a comprehensive discussion with the stakeholders involved. So that includes committee the whole, includes administration and the public. So we want to determine, are we on the right track before we actually start writing regulations? So being able to understand again, and part of our guiding principles is really the purpose of it and have a collective buy-in on exactly that before we go the extra step to actually write those details of regulations. So the approach for this 50% was sort of to walk you through that story of all the work that we've completed thus far that's really informed our decisions on what we're proposing to change for each of these elements. So of course that include the background analysis, the best common practice review, um, and then the engagement. So to inform those key areas. So one thing that we did want to highlight is that we recognize this is not a bylaw update. This is a rewrite, right? So um, in some senses, we expect to see sort of everything uh, be updated, or there's probably a lot of topics on here that you're not seeing. Uh, the approach for the 50% was to really dig deeper on those elements that we were finding coming up quite frequently in our previous spaces. Um, especially in the community as well. So sort of those hot topics that we know people are interested in. Um, so that's what we've highlighted the document around, but we recognize that there's still many different elements that we wanna make sure that we are bringing up to date and ensuring work for Edson. 
um, for the sake of the 50 percent though wanting to sort of focus on those those key elements so for the 50 percent draft again it's it's sort of about building uh, and telling that story so what we found is those key takeaways uh, from the background analysis so staff can use audits those key gaps uh, that might be missing for those areas then what we heard, uh, and you'll notice in some cases it's not applicable because we did engage on some pretty specific topics, or as you know, there's very specific things that people might be interested in. Uh, but that's just more so, yeah, key takeaways, concerns uh, from the public. And then what we learned. So when we're looking at our best practice and common review, what is it we're finding that other, other municipalities are doing? And sort of what are those key takeaways that are going to help us uh, decide on our approach? And then, of course, it was informed by the guiding principles. So you'll see that we try and highlight exactly what those proposals are and how they relate back to our guiding principles again as that sort of lens. So uh, I did want to also communicate that we will we'll go through, we want to go through as much as we can, uh, but we will pause for questions and discussion halfway through. So I'm going to go through about five or six, I think, of the key areas. We'll pause. Uh, if there's any questions, we can always go back to those slides. And then Jennifer will take us through the rest. So to begin with, uh, one of the more significant changes that we were able to look into is consolidation of the land use districts. So what we looked at is putting these districts side by side and understanding, okay, where are the redundancies? Where are their overlaps? Uh, is there ability for us to actually consolidate and in some cases increase flexibility through having more generalized land use districts? So for example, up on the screen, you'll see the residential. So uh, in general, or in total, we're looking at 18 proposed land use districts, but you can see a significant consolidation just even in the residential districts. Driveway, so this was something that we were hearing actually quite a bit through uh, community engagement. So this isn't something necessarily that, you know, it was something that in our background analysis was picked up on, it's something to improve on, but we were finding that there were some specific concerns from the public um, the driveway requirements just might be a bit outdated and it's worth understanding sort of the appropriateness or suitability of those specific requirements and how we want to address them in the bylaw. Uh, so uh, some comments about it being too restrictive um, and a desire for some increased flexibility on how we address driveways. Uh, so our approach is to consider the distance between driveways. So to, to be able to preserve somewhat on street parking where applicable, of course, and then ensure that the driveway requirements are sufficient to accommodate the vehicles at Edson. So that was an, another thing that we felt was really important in the Edson context. When you're looking at stall dimensions, you know, they should be relative and work for the local context and the vehicles that we're seeing here. So you're not getting cars that are in the sidewalk and interrupting that uh, pedestrian connectivity. Secondary suites. So uh, again, this was another hot topic. We heard a lot of uh, concerns about secondary suites and challenges with the way that the bylaw is currently regulating it. Uh, it's currently listed as owner occupied. So with that uh, specific terminology, it means that only people who own the property and live there can apply for and develop a secondary suite. And legally, a land use bylaw can't actually regulate the user, um, so the person that's in the home. So only the, the number or density of those units. Uh, we also heard that they tend, because the bylaw is unclear or overly restrictive, that there is a prevalence of some more illegal suites uh, and then some concerns around parking. Uh, so sim similar concerns that we, we heard through our community engagement. So for our approach, uh, changing it to secondary, to call it a secondary suite, and then adding definitions and graphics and actual categories to the types of suites that you can apply for, rather than just calling it secondary suite, making it very clear that there are these different options. And then by doing so, you have the ability to add provisions that are specific to that type of suite so that you're not ending up with sort of a wide range of restrictive rules that are, are not necessarily appropriate for the type of suite. Uh, so, for example, if you have a suite above a detached garage in the back, you might be able to add some more specific regulations on, for example, window placement to ensure, again, that you're still mitigating any potential negative impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. Um, same thing, making sure that the parking is sufficient. Uh, I think in general for the parking through the bylaw, it's this fine line by ensuring that the parking requirements are appropriate, again, to mitigate against any negative impacts or making sure that parking supply is sufficient, 
while also still being flexible and not so overly restrictive or onerous with those with those ratios. Uh, and then adding provisions to allow more than one suite on uh, properties in appropriate districts. For home-based businesses, uh, currently there's only one category that regulates that. Uh, the requirements are at times a bit unclear. Uh, as well, they allow for a little bit more activity that, than usual for, especially if there's only the one uh, home-based category. Uh, and typically those home-based businesses, depending on the category, um, what you want to be looking at is understanding and making sure that there's less impact on the, or, or the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, so we, we heard that there's a need and desire for more home-based businesses, especially in this new post-COVID world that we're living in. Uh, and looking at the different land use bylaws, most, if not all, have different tiers to allow for greater flexibility. So what we're proposing for Edson, again, understanding that there is a variety in the different types of residential areas that we found, uh, home-based business major and then home-based business minor. So those major, major ones allowing a more intense that may, uh, you, you may be able to tell that they're in the neighborhood. Um, so still having specific provisions though, to make sure that there's minimal impact. And then in those rural residential districts, being a little bit more flexible on the types of businesses that you can have there. Uh, for example, allowing auto repair on a lot that's much larger. Uh, so examples, hairdresser, massage therapist, people that are having visits to the property might have a sign out front. Home-based business minor, again, the, the intent is to have no impact. You shouldn't know that it exists in your neighborhood. Um, and then again, to increase flexibility and make it easier for residents, uh, making it a permitted use and having no development permit required, which is also going to be an ease on administration and how they are processing those applications. So all in all, just making uh, increasing the efficiency there. So an example is a home office and accountant. You're not having any visitors. You're basically using your home address as your business address. Shipping containers, so currently not regulated in the bylaw. Uh, there is a desire to support the use of shipping containers as it's a cost-effective and affordable storage option for a lot of business owners. So we did hear so this is something that we were engaging on and we did hear that there was a desire to ensure that they are supported through this bylaw. Um, most communities sort of regulate these in different ways. Uh, so depending on the district, whether they're allowed or not, and then also to having requirements that restrict the number and then also where they're placed to sort of eliminate, eliminate or limit the uh, negative visual impacts. So what we're proposing, a uh, development permit required every every time for a shipping container. Uh, in residential districts, so those more established districts, only allowing them on a temporary basis for construction purposes. So oftentimes they're used to store the construction materials or your, your furniture if you need to. Uh, and then discretionary in those rural residential districts with a maximum to allow. For commercial districts, discretionary with a max of three industrial permitted up until three and then if you want more with a max of five you're looking at it being a discretionary use and with those as they're added into those specific districts there'd be specific provisions that would ensure that again there is a limit impact to the surrounding area so for example siting requirements it has to be behind the primary building screening requirements, fencing or landscaping, um, the, the materials used, the paint to match the principal dwelling. Um, so those, those specific ones to make sure that it's, it's still in keeping with the character of the area. So that was a lot. Let's pause. Um, and, and if you have any questions, we're happy to answer those. Okay, if you have any questions, okay, Councilor Moore. Uh, through the chair, uh, to yourself. Um, so, uh, garden suite, is that the same as a granny suite? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it is. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Councillor Taylor. <laughs> you, you know, your side turned it up. Through the, yeah, through the chair. Um, just wondering, you talk about the shipping containers. Um, is there, will there be regulations on the size of the containers in terms of, you see a limit on uh, the number you have is there's a size. Sorry if I missed that. Yeah, 
Yeah, through the chair, typically there would be size specifications in a definition. So, I mean, there's different ways that you can approach that. In some cases, municipalities will have like shipping container large, shipping container small. So that's something that we can look at and being specific as to how big they can be. I don't personally know what those dimensions typically look like. 20 and 40. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying you could have three, but three and 40 is. Right, yeah. Could be, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So go on here. The other thing that can come into play too is your site coverage. So typically mm -hmm. uh, a lot size has a maximum site coverage. So maybe you you can you know, even have three, but if your site coverage is already maxed, you won't be able to have any more. So, so that comes into play as well. Mm -hmm. So both can be used. And that's a good distinction to be made that the bylaw should be clear as to how these would be treated. So again, with a bylaw, there's such a trickle effect. Whatever you add, you have to make sure that it's clear as to what it is. So there'd be specific verbiage around the fact that this would be considered as part of your site coverage. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your work on this. This has been a, a lot of work to date and still a lot of work to, to be done, but I'm, I'm very excited about the progress you're making. Uh, the, the part on shipping containers is an interesting one because I've had conversations with residents. I do like uh, the flexibility, uh, specifically when it comes to construction or, or people are dealing with certain situations where they can have a, uh, a temporary basis in residential neighborhoods. Um, certainly, I don't want to see it permanent uh, necessarily. Um, but my concern is in the commercial district and industrial districts. Uh, some of our lots, we're an industrial community, as you're aware. Uh, we have large lots, some of them are not visible. Uh, from the highway or from the streets. And quite frankly, I don't see a reason why we would need to restrict uh, the amount of containers on those lots. Um, you know, there's, I, I know some, some right now have seven or eight and you wouldn't know it because they're not noticeable unless you're actually behind their fenced compound or, or are in those areas. So I just was wondering what the reasoning behind that is. Um, and then how you would deal with, since it's been unregulated, how you deal with those that already have been in place for upwards of a decade. Um, and now we're going to say, well, you can only have three. And some of these places probably want even more than they have now. I'm throwing a lot out there. <laughs> uh, that's great feedback. Um, the, the number was largely based on just our own experience of what can seem onerous. Um, but again, I think it comes back to the principle of what suits best for what's best for Edson. Um, and if more than four to five containers in an industrial district is is appropriate, then that's something we can certainly look at um, with them keeping in mind the provisions for the screening and all that sort of thing to mitigate any impact. Um, do you want to add something? Well, I, I, I was also going to mention the fact that if they're listed as discretionary, it, they could be listed as discretionary without it could be discretionary above three. Yes. And then it's up to your discretion. Mm -hmm. and, and that gives you a little bit more flexibility based on the actual merits of the proposal. So like you say, based on the specific lot um, to allow more than what's listed, but still gives some teeth if you wouldn't like to allow, you know, to be fully covered with shipping container. Yeah. I just, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking town of Edson, you know, I'll certainly, Having three next to the downtown core is far more noticeable than if, as you head out further down the highway. Uh, we have some pretty large lots with um, large companies that have uh, quite a few. So, um, and it's the most feasible way for them to conduct business. And it doesn't, I don't think it actually, I think it probably enhances the area because you don't have this stuff stacked outside um, in for everybody to see it's actually locked up and stored away in a container. So it's Go ahead, Chair, if I could supplement as well. So another thing that will come into play is uh, the districts might change a little bit, right? So maybe what happens is what we call commercial today might be some different light industry, right? That could be. And so then the, that, that also comes into play. And also conversely, and that's why I think the regulations you put in to support this is also important because some of our commercial properties have residential properties adjacent to them, right? So in that context, having seven would not be ideal. So um, you have to have a number somewhere. Um, but I think, uh, like the lady said, uh, the regulations will go along with it in terms of how you cite them and screen them. And maybe you put a provision that, that if, uh, if uh, there's a residential property with adjacent or within a certain distance of a commercial property, you can only have one, right? So that's something to do. So, 
Anyway, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Gail comments on seed cans. I'm wrong because they also come small and get them eight by eight. So we're going to do an outright ban. And the reason I'm thinking that because we're people that question. What? Sorry, seed can. Mr. Chair, uh, there's not not an outright ban here. No, but that's what I'm asking. In the residential area, it says for temporary use only. I want yeah. clarification. So okay. in the residential, you're not, you're not referencing commercial. No, right? okay. Uh, no, strictly residential, because okay. in some cases. If they're suitable and they're painted nicely, they would actually, you know, they're a way stronger can container than someone building something. So if uh, you can get them eight by eight, so if someone wanted to put an eight by eight that wasn't interfering, would we have an option for that? Because I agree, if you put a forty foot C can mm -hmm. in a residential area, it doesn't get a match. Mm -hmm. But in some of the larger lots, like in Grand Prairie Trail, Glenwood, and stuff, if somebody had a small C can that was appropriately painted it would not be an eyesore. So is there going to be an option for that? Because the argument I have with people, a sea can is one of your best containers, most secure mm -hmm. to, to build a building the same cost more. So I'm just curious if there would be any kind of option for that in an appropriate area. So Chair, I think that's where we may, we could get further specific and do different categories of shipping containers. Because right. I think, yeah, you'd, you'd want to be specific in terms of what you'd want to allow in a more residential area. Right. There are, yeah, it's a, as soon as you get into those more established residential areas, again, depending on what they look like, the only challenge, and I've seen this in other municipalities too, is that they can be great, but you don't always get that. And so you have to be able to have the tools in your bylaw to make sure that you can regulate and, and still get what you're hoping for without sort of being stuck with approving it just because it's a possibility in the bylaw. So I think, yes, it's a fine, it's a balancing act, but I think that's something to consider is, is being able to categorize, okay, more of a smaller one that's not gonna have as big of an impact uh, that might not be as tall. I'm not sure what those levels are, but, that, but that's an important comment, like you said, that's, that's specific to Edson. Where there might be more variety there that we should be considering to allow for it in residential districts and something that we could be asking the community about as well too because we, we did find that when we asked about them being in residential areas that the general sentiment was the, that people would not want to see them however you know that's probably thinking of those very large ones and less so about the smaller scale size yeah okay thank you uh, through the chair to uh, the presenters, uh, administration and council as well. Um, and Mayor Zahara sort of indicated this, when we have a lot of um, industry owners, uh, homeowners, uh, perhaps uh, not following or, or have followed the old rules that are now changing. So how do we have a, like a grandfather clause or a, something like that in place to uh, uh, mitigate, you know, trying to enforce something overnight you know, some issues like that don't say i word that well is there gonna be a, do you usually see a time frame of of adjustments or how is that how is our vision for that process happening when this time comes uh through the chair so the municipal government act provides some guidance in this area and it's uh it falls into the category of legally non-conforming uses and legally non-conforming building structures um, so the, the key thing to note here is so long as the building or structure was legally existing prior to the passing of a new bylaw. So if you have a development permit for a shed that is um, 10 meters high and the new standard is 8 meters, but you have a development permit for it and the new bylaw says, nope, no rules, 8 meters, you're good with that 10 meter structure. There's some rules around how you treat that, so you can't make any additions. If it burns down, you can't rebuild exactly what you had before. You have to play by the new rules of the game. There's some other rules around uh, legally non-conforming uses. So if that use, so if say, for example, you've changed uh, uh, uses in a district and um, you can no longer have a restaurant, but there's a restaurant that's been approved to operate, that restaurant can keep going. Um, and as soon as they stop, if they cease operating that use for a period of time, I believe it's 60 days. Um, six months. Six, six months. months. Thank you. There's six, six, six. Yeah. There's a six in there. Um, it can no longer continue. 
So you would have to buy it like, by the meaning of the rules of the day. And that transfers over to the land use bylaw itself. Um, so it's not something we have to write in. Sometimes it's helpful. Some municipalities really like to repeat different sections of the Municipal Government Act for easy reference. Um, but, but there's rules in place to kind of guide that, to bring you into the new bylaw while without making it happen instantly. It's not instantly onerous. And, and one thing I will add is something that we have talked about with administration is making sure that we're clear through this process and educating on exactly that. Because you know, the community's gonna have a lot of questions, especially when we talk about consolidating districts. What does that mean for my property? You know, are my are certain things being taken away from me? Can I now not do things that I could do before? So I think that's been a critical part of this process is ensuring that throughout it, especially when we come with a 90% bylaw, that we're being clear and explaining exactly that. So, hey, what does this mean for me as a property owner? What you have is okay. This is what it looks like. Uh, so that's something that I think will be quite crucial in communicating. Yeah. And just to add to that to the chair, um, there's other approaches as well where a land use bylaw can give you a little bit more cushion. So if you had a house, for instance, and no, you no longer can have a house because the land use district has changed. So now you have to build a, a four story structure, um, but you have a property owner who just wants to add a couple square foot feet to their deck. There's allowances you can build into your land use bylaws so that even though the MGA rules would say, um, this is your, your minimum, you have to comply with the new standards or if it burns down, et cetera, et cetera. You can add a little bit more and make moderate changes while not being completely left to building a four-story building. This is in more um, intensive changes of, <laughs> of bylaw updates. So very common in downtown redevelopment situations. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? No? Um, carry on, please. Um, so one of the very exciting and um, dividing topics that a land use bylaw captures is parking. Um, it's a thing that usually gets people really excited or angry or me bouncy. Um, so one of the things that we found is that in the existing land use bylaw, you have land uses, so the terms of how a piece of land is used, and then parking requirements that have a number based on a use, and those two terms aren't speaking to each other. So one of the things that can be really challenging for a developer or an administration is to say, well, what, what number am I applying to this use? So that was one of the things that we noticed that, and it can be very challenging um, for a developer and administration to come together and have a conversation about what exactly are the parking requirements. Um, it is also very common, especially in Alberta, to have very, very high parking requirements, and sometimes they can be too onerous and they actually prohibit development. So making sure that we're addressing that concern so that you're providing sufficient parking and being flexible while not actually making it uh, impossible to go to your place of business because you have no place to park. Um, so what we, we've learned in general is um, in a lot of other communities, uh, parking requirements are being reduced and in some communities altogether axed. Um, understanding that Edson and Edmonton or Calgary or Vancouver or Florida are all in very different places in terms of uh, climate and public transportation. Um, axing your parking requirements, not something I would do. Um, you were gonna wanna still have some ability to drive and park and get out when it's minus 40 and purchase your milk and get back to your vehicle. Um, next slide. So our- uh, Oh, excuse me. Uh, the chair, presenters. Um, what about axing parking requirements in sections of the community? And the reason I mentioned that is like our main street, like to build down there, you've got to buy the neighbor, tear down this building so you can build. Like, so there's like, I mean, I get if you're gonna build a new strip mall, we get the parking requirements because it makes sense, but we have, you know, our C1 district is zero lot lines. There's no parking down there besides what's provided by the community. And, you know, you can't have a business because, oh, they've got no parking stall. So nope, you're not coming in. So is that possible through this as well? Through the chair, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our, uh, on our approach pieces, one of the things we've investigated is the concept of shared parking. So this usually applies to commercial places where you have um, either uses uh, that don't that don't have the same operational hours. So you have a giant parking lot, a church and a daycare, or a church and an office is a really great example. 
because churches tend to fill up their parking lots on Sundays, um, but daycares don't operate on Sundays, so they can share parking, uh, making the best use of the space without each business having to provide a mass amount of parking for themselves. Um, this is also common in downtown where you have common lots, uh, parking lots that multiple businesses will share from. So there's different agreements and different regulatory tools that we can use to create these opportunities, but it really builds in a lot of flexibility. Um, so you're making the best use of your space, while well, again, also meeting the needs of your residents. So I'll, I'll just add through the chair as well, right. too, that that's part of the first point is generally trying to understand where they can be reduced uh, in a way that makes sense for it. And so to your comment, are there specific districts or can we be even more specific to corridors where the parking might be reduced or that might be changed? Again, polarizing topic. Um, so I think part of this process is really understanding that collective vision and what the need is um, to make sure that we're still addressing that need, but also being flexible enough so that there is an ability for someone that has no physical space to provide on-site parking um, to have an option. Yeah. Um. Um, one question. So when we hit a topic like this, you don't mind us just jumping in? Yeah. Okay. Councilor Byron. Thanks. Uh, through the chair to uh, the presenters. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, cash in lieu of parking option? I know it's mentioned a few times in the presentation. Uh, through the chair, absolutely. So there's, and this is actually kind of plays into a C1 downtown situation. Um, it requires some more uh, administrative uh, uh, like another bylaw typically um, to deal with the mechanics of how cash and lieu is accepted. But usually what will occur is in a development permit situation where you're building something new and you have to provide X number of stalls, you can provide cash to the municipality instead of those parking stalls that would go into a fund. That fund would then um, provide or go towards the upkeep um, acquisition of public parking. So it goes into a pot. It requires some other um, background bylaws and work um, that doesn't live directly in the land use bylaw, but it's something that we can put the framework in the bylaw that you can exercise that over your day. Okay, thank you. There was a question about parking. Um, just to clarify what Councillor Presidio puts up, so we can have the option. So, like we're saying, Main Street, that we can have zero restriction in certain areas. And I heard that correctly. Through the chair, yes, that's something. I okay, thank you. Carry on. Oh, I'm continuing. Sorry. <laughs> um, architectural and landscape uh, requirements tend to, in the existing land use bylaw, live throughout all the different districts, um, which can be a little bit cumbersome and difficult, uh, especially when they're different, so so significantly different from one district to the next. So it kind of it doesn't keep everybody on the same playing field. It's one rule for this set of guys, another rule for this set of guys. Um, so, so keeping all the, our architectural and landscape requirements kind of collectively um, and apply them where, where necessary, uh, we think it's going to be quite helpful. Um, typically, uh, in other communities, you will have, there's, there's a degree of discretion and maze and shoulds statements and design kind of language, which is typically why they, they sit in a different document called the Urban Design Guidelines. There's different language that we can use and we can apply uh, in a land use bylaw where it's more objective based. Um, we're trying to achieve X, Y, and Z. And then the way that you achieve that goal, that's where the development authority or administration has a little bit of discretion and they can work with the developer based on whatever is more um, you know, cost effective, um, whatever is going to suit the design of the proposed development that sort of thing. So um, part of our approach is to make sure that um, when we're including these things, it's specific enough that administration has the teeth that they need to actually make sure that they're complied with, but also flexible enough that if there's a better way or another way of achieving the same objective, that administration can allow it to happen. So again, that fine balance between being flexible while also maintaining a standard. And then also ensuring that Again, the approach is, is specific and respectful to the context of Edison. So really common, especially in landscape requirements, is um, they, they very frequently don't take climate or salt 
or dirt or X, Y, and Z into account. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we're picking um, requirements that are actually respecting the geographical region that you're in, different maintenance concerns, the fact that it's a winter city, those sorts of things, keeping all that in mind. Councilor Fire. Uh, thanks. That's with the chair to it's actually Matt Clayton. Um, so regarding the um, urban design guidelines, that's something that I think has been brought up a couple of times, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Is is that something that we can can jump on to to um, to form a design standard? So to, to the chair. So if I'm understanding your question, Councilor Byer, it's about having that separate document for design guidelines. Um, so I don't recall us talking about that before. If we have, I apologize. Um, I guess absolutely that's a, that's an option that is, as the lady said, you can embed this rest up in your mind use pilot or you can have it on a separate uh, a guideline document. Um, it's certainly something we can entertain if that was the will of council to go down that road. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's that's the I believe we've talked about design engineering design standards. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we're good to go. Um, land use and definitions. This is where I get really excited and everybody else falls asleep. Um, so this is terminology, this is the, lang the legal language that comes up. Um, and, and one of the things that we've really seen uh, in a lot of land use bylaws, but and, and Edson is no exception, is um, kind of a misuse of definitions or, or an inefficient use of definitions is regulating within them as opposed to regulating in your bylaw. So by, so an example of this would be is um, a hair salon and we're defining it by a hair salon is a hundred meters squared and it has three chairs and two employees. Well, then by nature, a hair salon that is 150 meters squared is no longer a hair salon. So if we are trying to cover and regulate a certain size or restrict it, we can do that in other areas of the bylaw. So one of the key things that we wanted to look at was how, how do we make sure that the definitions and the land uses are actually serving a function and that we're regulating in appropriate areas of the bylaw. Because um, what ends up happening is when you're overly restrictive in your land use category, like a hair salon with three chairs and two employees and hundred meters squared, is now you also need a hair salon major with four chairs and six employees and 250 meters squared. So your list of land uses can get really, really long, really, really quickly um, when we're overly prescriptive in the words. And then your districts, which in some cases can be two pages, are now six pages because you have to list every single possible type of hair salon you could ever imagine. Um, so try and keep that simple. Uh, build in some longevity in the bylaws. So you're not constantly amending it every time somebody wants to add another chair to your salon um, is one of the key approaches that we have. Um, trying to consolidate where it's appropriate. Um, it's not necessary to have multiple land uses, get rid of them, put them under one category, looking at it more from the perspective of what is the impact that that use is having? And it, does it differ? Does a hair salon differ from a barbershop? No, not really. People are going in and getting a haircut. The hair length just changes. Um, and then finally, bylaw look and feel. And this really comes down to the people who are using it every day. Um, this kind of leans a little bit into uh, the previous topic about land uses. And I'm making sure that we're, we're front loading the bylaw with the rules about how to read it, how to interpret it, how, what, what classifies a residential district, which districts are commercial districts, etc. So providing some really clear rules so you're not hunting through the entire bylaw trying to understand what it is that it's saying. Um, making sure that the layout makes sense. So again, you're not on a scavenger hunt trying to find that one provision hiding away in that one section, which is really exhausting and time consuming from experience. I don't recommend it. Um, and then where we can utilize in graphics. Uh, Becky showed um, one of the graphics in the CCANS kind of gives you a taste of, of some of the, the look and feel that we're trying to bring. So not only is it um, inundated with graph, it's not inundated with graphics, but it, it's clear and concise that a member of administration can show somebody a picture and say, this is the kind of plan we're looking for. These are the kind of dimensions that we need. Um, sometimes a picture says far more words than a bylaw. So um, using them strategically where we can, I hope that's even more good which is exactly what this is saying. 
uh, some of the other topics that we didn't go into detail today, but we have certainly looked through and are available in more detail in the 50% document, um, boarding houses and lodging houses, family care and group home situations. This is another really uh, good example of regulating a user and how to use uh, the fun conundrum. And I say fun like genuinely, because I really I find this topic very interesting is the mobile home, modular home, manufactured home scenario. Um, they all kind of wear the same hat and they all have subtly different meanings. So what is it that we're trying to regulate? Um, and then the nature of temporary development permits, uh, making sure that temporary is really what we're regulating is something for a temporary basis and they don't become temporarily permanent. Maybe before we continue to the rest, which is just engagement and our next step. So quite brief, is there any additional questions or comments about those specific key areas? Any questions? Mr. Mayor. Uh, not necessarily specifically to your presentation, but a topic of discussion we've had. I guess it does apply to the, the uh, uh, CCAN storage container question is tiny homes. And uh, we have seen that homes are now being constructed out of things such as CCAN. So mm -hmm. what, uh, what thoughts, what processes, what ideas are going to be incorporated? into uh, this land use bylaw. Not that I'm a proponent of making homes out of sea cans, but I am a proponent of tiny homes. So um, especially as we talk about affordability and uh, utilizing our lands uh, in the most economically feasible way. Um, has there been any discussion or are we not there yet? Uh, do we have a chair for the, for the sea cans discussion? It's been something that I previously had had lots of heated discussion with in, in different occasions. Again, of course, the idea of shipping containers, because there's a lot of cool things being done out there for sure, right? Um, a lot of innovative ways to use shipping containers, either as is or as parts to build a home. The, the challenge is, again, especially with something like design guidelines or things that are difficult to regulate in terms of, you know, you've got a regulation that says, must look attractive. That's an over-exaggeration, but how do we actually understand from administration's perspective what that means? Similarly, what does that mean for me as an applicant? Because if I want to do something simple, of course I'm going to argue that mine's attractive, and administration is going to have a hard time arguing the opposite to make sure that you're, get, you're still getting a quality product that's not going to have an impact on the neighborhood. So I think that's the challenge, and I think that's why shipping containers as an option for a dwelling isn't necessarily as common. Now, the topic of tiny homes, I'm not sure if you have experience with that. Again, something that is being explored. Uh, the challenge with it though, I think is depending on the district and the plot size that you have, like it does, it's a very specific type of development. Um, so again, if there's buy-in, if there's interest in allowing for something like that, I think you just have to be cognizant of how you're crafting something like that. Uh, I don't know if you have experience with that you want to add <laughs> through the chair. So a lot of the different residential districts will have like a character statement that kind of captures how that district is supposed to look and feel. And with those, it has different provisions that have lot size requirements or minimum floor areas for a house, that sort of thing. Not too often in like urban small lot settings, do you get a minimum size of a house requirement? You get a maximum lot, you get a maximum height, you get a maximum floor area, you get a maximum lot coverage. So technically in a lot of the smaller lot situations, you could build a tiny home because there's no restriction on the minimum. Where you see restrictions on minimums that you it needs to be at least this floor area is a lot of country residential style districts where you want big houses, they don't want because it doesn't fit within the character on these big acreage lots and these really tiny postage mouse houses. Um, another approach that's really common and this uh, is kind of emerged lately, but it tends to be developer driven um, is if and it's kind of treated similar to like a mobile home park. Uh, so you'll have a developer come in, they'll have a large amount of land and then they'll apply for a special district or draft a special district or go to my favorite tool, which is the direct control district. Also very polarizing discussion. Um, we can, love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it can be a good tool to you to, to apply that type of product um, or you can create your own district. Uh, whether or not you're treating it as like a condominium or whether you're not, you're doing individual lots or districting it 
that way. Um, so there's a lot of tools in your arsenal for how to regulate tiny homes, but in a lot of the districts, there's really nothing preventing you from building a tiny home. Uh, through the chair, I will add it in previous experience, we've done it in a bylaw where same question came about, where's how are we accommodating this? If someone were to come to our door and say, hey, we wanna be able to develop this. What we did is we added specific provisions within what they would call a comprehensive development. So not a, not a direct control district, but more so condiment, like, like you said, a mobile park where you can actually you can ask for you know, a master site plan. You can understand what the vision is for that area. You can get a little bit deeper into asking for requirements to understand what that development would look like. Uh, but yeah, to, to Jenica's point, I think part of the, I won't say debate, but part of, um, I think an important factor with something like tiny homes is sort of understanding again, going a step above with the bylaw, yes, it's our tool, but what are we looking at? What is the vision for the community? Is our policy, is our vision telling us that this is something that we want to see uh, in terms of our residential development? I think that's part of potentially some of that higher level thinking um, to help sort of set that vision and guide this land use file as the tool to implement it. Um, in some cases, it's sort of taking a step back and understanding, okay, what do we actually want to see happen? And then the bylaw can be more specific to exactly that. But yeah, it's very common, I think, these days. Okay, do we have any more questions from the previous? Nope, oh, carry on, please. Awesome. So for this upcoming engagement, which starts tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, we are going to the public at the Leisure Center uh, from four to seven to talk about the topics that they told us they care about. So coming and sharing what we have so far about home-based businesses and secondary suites and seeing how that's landing with the community. How are they feeling about this? Do they have questions about the approach we have? And just getting a sense of, is this hitting the right mark? We'll be doing the same thing at the grocery store tomorrow as well uh, around lunch hour. And then we'll be connecting virtually with the uh, business community specifically to check in with them as well. Um, um, with that, I'll pass it over to Chris. <laughs> If this means that we're getting to the end, we don't want to talk much. I was wondering why they kept you back. Yeah, way in the back. He's not even allowed to sit. We didn't, we didn't hear you snoring back there. So. No, but it was getting really close. <laughs> not because they are putting a great presentation on, but the reason they don't let me talk is I think Landy's bylaws should be one page and that everything should be discretionary. <laughs> so I don't get to talk a whole lot of these types of things, but uh, I think just couple things to reiterate, uh, two big parts of our approach. One is you, you see it in what Dana talked about with the, the engagement. We're big on feedback loops. So we don't like to come talk to people, get things from them without telling people how we're using them. It doesn't mean we use everything. It just means we inform them how this information was used, synthesize it, how it was used to inform the direction of the bylaw. <coughs> the other piece is that you see, even with your questions that you see very quickly, this is a is a complicated document and it's a complicated tool and it's meant to continually evolve and change over time because your context continually evolves and changes over time but where we see them becoming very dysfunctional is when they don't change and they don't have a reason behind the rules so if you ask a question and it says why are we doing it this way and the answer is it's because it's in the bylaw it probably means it's not really tied to your context so that's the important piece, and that's the importance of these conversations is to get better understanding of where that flexibility needs to be and how we need to think about the unique situations here, not just take a set of rules from some other place, dump them into a new fancy document and say, here's your rules. So those are two big keys to our approach. And just to give you a sense of where we're going after we, we do have the, the conversations with the second engagement over the, the course of tonight being part of that and tomorrow in the business community. Uh, we want to take all this feedback and actually make some changes to the direction because what this then leads to is the 90%. And that's where we get close to, here's, here's what we all need to agree on. So we want to work through this basically through the end of this year and into early 2023, so that we again come back with that feedback loop to come talk to you, say, here's what we heard, here's how we took the direction and the structure of the 50%. We're really close now. Are we all comfortable? And once we're all comfortable, then that's when we move into the adoption process. And so we anticipate that going into the spring of next year, and then you going through your process to actually now make that the new rules of the land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So I believe that's it for us. Does council have any further questions for them? Thank you for your presentation. I just have one quick question. You guys involving the Chamber of Commerce, you're interacting with them. Okay. So thank you for your presentation and you can stay if you'd like, or if you have to sneak out and go back and get some more sushi, then by all means. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, with that said, we're moving on to D2 Asset Management Update, Jeffrey Fan. Um, so my name is Jeffrey. Um, I'm the engineer and an asset coordinator here. Um, this is my first presentation of this type, so uh, just, uh, I guess bear with me. <laughs> um, so this update will uh, inform council about what the town's asset management plan currently is and what it is not. And, uh, you know, it's primarily based on the uh, Asset Management continu Continuity Plan uh, that was completed in July 2021, which is all, which is a joint effort between uh, engineering and planning and also uh, public sector digest our uh, asset management consultant. So we'll be talking about the uh, history of our asset management plan and the current state of the um, asset management plan. The um, existing gaps um, identified in the uh, plan and also uh, what are we doing next to enhance our uh, asset management plan. So regarding the history, um, the asset management program um, project actually started in uh, 2016 and again, Public Sector Digest um, or Citywide is our consultant. We have a um, asset management policy adopted in uh, 2016, and uh, we have general inventory based on records at hand, um, and they're entered in the system between uh, 2016 and 2018, um, and that including you know as built um, like basically all the hard copy um, files that we can find. And um, we drafted the uh, asset management plan in 2018, um, which is a moment in time assessment. So uh, um, it's only, I guess, reflecting um, what our state is um, at 2018 and probably you know a little bit before 2018. Um, yeah, and then uh, we added some additional kind of uh, capabilities um, in uh, 2019 and also uh, last year, um, you know, including some um, equipment, um, you know, more uh, um, software, um, uh, stuff like that. <clears throat> so we'll be moving on to the uh, current state of our asset management plan. So we have age and as-built as -built based data on the town owned infrastructures and they are in the system or I should say the majority of them are in the system. Um, we have the condition assessment for roads completed in 2020 um, that's done through uh, Stantec and we're using their um, road matrix um, software. Um, we have completed partial condition assessment on other infrastructures. Uh, you know, our water, sanitary, uh, store, um, sidewalk, uh, those type of infrastructures. Uh, we do have a detailed risk and condition assessment for uh, town-owned fleets, um, and they are completed. Um, and we also have the condition assessment for um, about 30% um, of the uh, sanitary sewer mains um, to be completed. Uh, this year. I mean, the intention is to do as much as, as possible, but uh, 
we're looking at uh, roughly 30 percent and uh, we're aiming to have our storm sewer assessed uh, uh, next year too so um, but with all of those uh, condition assessment and also uh, data uh, we do recognize that uh, you know our data is stored in uh, various locations in various uh, software which means they're quite aggregated um, they need to be centralized. And uh, this is from our uh, asset management uh, continuity plan. Um, so I'll be talking about some of these um, gaps identified, um, you know, in terms of organization and people, um, strategy and planning, project prioritization, risk management, um, level of service and also uh, financial uh, management. Um, so some of the key gaps in uh, organization and people uh, is that uh, we uh, have very limited uh, organizational resource um, capacity for um, asset management plan. Um, and our asset management asset management plan has not yet been fully operationalized operationalized across the organization and our internal communications uh, regarding um, our asset management uh, process plan system um, may not be clear um, which means uh, you know it is pretty much siloed um, we also have um, key gaps in uh, strategy and, and planning. So um, our asset management policy, uh, which was, as mentioned before, completed in 2016, uh, is not current and should be updated. Like we haven't updated once, um, you know, the document once yet. Uh, and it's suggested that we do an update to the current um, asset management plan as well. That's the 2018. A document that I talked about. And uh, we also um, need to have current and future levels of service, uh, uh, you know, to have them clearly defined and uh, properly documented. Um, <clears throat> we also have gaps in uh, project prioritization. Um, you know, that means uh, we must have inclusion of growth and uh, demand related um, projects um, that's not, you know, varying by um, departments. Um, uh, we do have an infrastructure master plan, which is our uh, municipal servicing plan. Uh, we have that, but it's not consist consistently followed and serve as a, a guide for our capital uh, spending. Um, we also have a formal project prioritization process to develop budgets and uh, capital plans. Um, and our capital investments are most often made through informal processes, which means uh, you know, they're only uh, project specific. Like, you know, we don't really always consider how it ties to our asset management uh, process. Um, we also have some key gaps in risk uh, management as well. Uh, we, you know, even lack a, a high level understanding of uh, various risks associated with, you know, many of our assets. Um, we have basic risk models to support strategic lifecycle interventions and uh, project um, prioritization. And by life cycle interventions, I mean, you know, that's the uh, do nothing uh, corrective, corrective maintenance, uh, repair and rehab and uh, replacement and uh, reconstruction um, approaches. Um, we only have a broad, uh, we have a broad uncertainty on whether, uh, you know, each department actually uses any form of risk management to prioritize uh, uh, spending. And uh, we lack data to support sophisticated, sophisticated risk analysis. And, uh, you know, citywide is the software that we're using. Um, we do have some data and we 
you know, we, we can run the um, risk analysis on, you know, using the software, uh, but, you know, we still feel like we lack data, especially, uh, you know, inspected data. Um, so it's only, you know, it's only a, a, a risk um, determination based on, um, you know, what our current input is. It's not necessarily reflecting, you know, what the real condition um, are. Yeah, for our assets. Um, we also have uh, key gaps in our levels of service as well. We have broad uncertainty on whether departments have analyzed or even reviewed their current uh, level of service for their assets. Um, our key performance indicators are not systematically used uh, to monitor and evaluate uh, infrastructure programs. And uh, you know the performance indicators um, they are the measures of asset quality and uh, levels of service from the user's perspective. Um, you know, an example could be a pavement quality index, a number of water breaks, uh, you know, stuff like that. And uh, basically, they're just, you know, engineering uh, evaluations. Um, so our target, target levels of service have not been identified uh, for most of our assets. Um, and technical and customer performance metr metrics are retrieved as needed through informal processes. So which kind of ties back to, uh, you know, we just um, don't have a, <laughs> a very formal process for, for prioritizing our projects. And we also have uh, some gaps in uh, financial management as well. Uh, <clears throat> so the Asset groups such as uh, land improvements, parks and recreation, and uh, you know buildings of facilities, uh, they remain at basic assessment level. Uh, financial analysis may not include growth elements or service enhancements. Not all departmental budgeting processes consider cross-departmental initiatives um, or uh, project uh, bundling. So, you know, how can we combine the two projects to maximize our um, spending, right? Or most um, efficient way of spending. And uh, I want to focus more actually uh, on the uh, key gaps in uh, asset data because, uh, you know, if you don't have good data, your system is just uh, <laughs> just the software, right? It, it's, it's not doing the thing that it should be doing. So um, we lack, again, like we lack any formal data governance, uh, governance to ensure um, data integrity and continuity. So, you know, there's nothing, I guess, um, no document or no process saying, you know, uh, whose responsibility it is to uh, do this, what's it's required, uh, how the document is stored, uh, what type of information needs to be gathered, how deep it is, how wide it is, stuff like that. Um, we also lack um, structured and standardized database hierarchy. Um, so our asset groups, they're not quite um, uh, ranked um, to the most efficient um, way. Um, and we have partially disaggregated asset inventories in an incomplete state. And we also lack accurate assessed condition across all asset categories. Um, our existing inventory is not accurate uh, representation of the total asset uh, portfolio. So we might need um, to do more assessment on stuff like we never really considered, you know, our uh, street signs, right? Um, uh, park benches or stuff like that. Um, you know, what detail do we, do we want to, to go into? Um, so I just want to share a bit about, you know, why assessed data is so important. Um, so because data management is basically integral to a uh, successful asset management plan. Um, so, you know, we have uh, some sort of inventory, which is, you know, a starting point, uh, but the condition assessment is actually you know, the meat and potatoes of, <laughs> of the system, um, you know, 
they are to be used for the system to compute, um, you know, what's needed uh, budget-wise to, um, to do our project. Um, and it requires continuous improvement. And, um, you know, the, the better the accuracy of the uh, level of service or the accuracy of, of our, uh, you know, the, the, the state of our assets, uh, the better risk of failure analysis we can we can do. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's basically the goal of every uh, asset management plan. Like we want to take a proactive approach rather than a uh, reactive approach. Um, and that on the right hand side is, uh, uh, you know, a quote um, from the uh, British standard, British standard on uh, asset management. Um, so it is best practice that an, organi that an organization measure the level of service of its assets and analyze these against the requirements and expectations of its customers and users. So, um, yeah, like, I mean, they have like three <laughs> brochures or like series of like documents, but I think this is the most important uh, uh, guidance, um, um, you know, that every book every uh, municipality or every um, asset management um, professional should follow. Um, and uh, I got this from a, a book called uh, Infrastructure and, and uh, uh, Infrastructure Asset uh, Management. And uh, you can see that, um, you know, um, the, the level of data can be different and, uh, you know, different levels of data can yield um, different um, uh, decision-making uh, uh, types and, and processes. So you know, as you move more towards the, the bottom of the uh, triangle, um, it is getting more technical and, and, and uh, um, you know, engineering uh, oriented or specific. Um, but uh, you know, right now, I think we're, we're at the top <laughs> um, triangle or you know, for some of our assets, we might be uh, at the, um, the middle of the triangle, but we're definitely not um, at the bottom yet. And yeah, that's where we want to, to, to get to, uh, because you know, to achieve our organizational objectives, um, we have to make sure that all of our assets um, is capable of uh, delivering um, the level of service. Um, you know, if assets are not properly managed, um, risk increases. You know, we have like sudden uh, problems, you know, like uh, um, uh, road collapse or, or, or stuff like that. Um, and we must measure the risks through uh, structured uh, methods. So this is one way to look at, you know, why it's a structured approach, uh, because you don't want your data to be so um, aggregate, aggregated and, and, you know, you can't generate a, uh, a um, uh, formalized and, and centralized uh, decision. Um, so we, did identify the next steps needed to enhance our uh, asset management plan. Um, you know, we have year one, year two, year three identified, um, but today I'll be focusing on the uh, year one, which is uh, refined and uh, standardized. So, um, you know, our goal is to adopt a meaningful asset classification or asset uh, hierarchy structure. So we, you know, group our assets um, better or in the most uh, efficient way. Uh, you know, there might not be a, a you know, a standard across like every municipality, but we want it to be, you know, the best suited, uh, the best for Edson. Um, we also want to expand, maintain and enrich our current asset inventories and, and uh, data sets and uh, you know, that's not only your one um, thing, it, it should be, you know, as long as you have an asset management plan, um, this should be, you know, always ongoing. Um, and we must continue to build and refine a structured and consolidated uh, asset uh, register, which kind of ties back to the, to the first one, but I think this one is like more detailed, right? Now, you know, how do we name our assets? How um, do we properly, um, you know, determine 
or easily find our, our uh, asset information. You know, if a new employee comes into town, can they, you know, get on track very easily? Um, we also want to conduct a um, data gap analysis and uh, close information uh, gaps because we did notice that, uh, um, you know, some of our existing inventory still needs to be uh, cleaned up and, and uh, modified a bit. Um, and um, the last one is a topic uh, administration is always um, kind of discussing. It's something that we really wanted to do, but uh, currently we don't think we're quite uh, ready um, for that yet. Uh, but definitely, you know, we uh, should head towards, um, you know, reconciliation between um, our TCA and also our asset management inventories. Uh, I know the town of Devon, uh, I think two years ago, they just completed that and uh, uh, they're pretty uh, fast, um, you know, advanced um, in terms of their asset management uh, plan. Uh, I think we are too, but uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, now it's the time for us to, uh, to kind of really, you know, start working on it for us to actually, you know, make uh, use the plan um, daily. Right. Um, so <clears throat> this is a nice uh, diagram that I um, uh, searched up, and uh, it's actually based on uh, uh, BC's uh, asset management uh, framework. I think uh, you know it, it. It shows you know this is where the town of Edson wants to be, uh, or you know this should be our ultimate goal um, for the. For the system to to actually uh, work, and uh, of course it requires continuous uh, development and improvement. Um, you know, some people may think that uh, asset management plan is just you know a once for all thing, but it is not. It's it's always it's always evolving. There's always something that's driving it. Uh, like even even your assessed data, right? Like every year your your, your, your condition where data changes, um, you know, we fix this, but we have like other problems uh, that's coming up in the uh, next year or, 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 you know, next 10 years. So it's, it's um, you know, it's always ongoing. Um, so I guess uh, there's the, uh, the red, you know, is the assess um, um, part of it. Uh, we also have the plan and we also have the, uh, uh, you know, implementation um, of the um, of the uh, process, and this is more based on the operation and maintenance approach. Uh, and by that, I mean it's actually a operation and maintenance for the asset management uh, system or plan itself. It's not the operation and maintenance for the actual asset. Um, so this is. You know, leaning more towards the governance um, uh, of it. Um, so, yeah, we need to review um, our uh, asset management uh, practices um, to to see if their economy efficiency and effectiveness uh, have changed. Um, we, as I keep on say, saying, we must have assessed data, so we have to assess asset data, we have to assess human and uh, uh, financial resources are required to maintain and uh, um, you know, determine the level of service uh, for our plan. Um, and we must continuously address our servicing gaps as they um, come up. Um, and in terms of planning, um, we want to formalize our, you know, our commitment to improving um, our asset management plan and also the operation and maintenance of the plan. Uh, we also have to document where improvements in efficiency and effectiveness uh, of the plan are needed and uh, how we will make these uh, improvements. Um, so we must continuously develop work plans, processes, and procedures to achieve the improvements um, in terms of operation and maintenance uh, activities. Um, 
uh, in our policy and, and strategy. Um, and we also have to take a look at our long-term uh, financial plan. Um, and that's, uh, you know, to consider full life cycle costs uh, when planning and prioritizing capital projects. You know, is every department uh, speaking the same language? Uh, has every department came, you know, come together and, and using an asset management approach to, to have a, um, uh, uh, you know, a most efficient way of, of doing a project or projects? Uh, can any projects be combined? Um, you know, done together, um, stuff like that. Um, and lastly, there's that implementation uh, portion. Uh, you know, <laughs> everything is useless unless we actually start implementing, um, you know, all the stuff that we talked about before. Um, and there's also measure and report. So, you know, we have to document, um, you know, even the, the assess and planning and, and you know, involvement of the asset management plan itself. Um, so basically measure your assets and report um, your asset based on, um, you know, the assessed data or the measured data. And um, we have to be on track and also identify um, gaps uh, in terms of, um, you know, um, governance. Um, so, you know, I think uh, some people might, you know, focus too heavy on, on data assessment and kind of uh, forget about, you know, your actual plan needs to be uh, constantly reviewed and measured, you know, your um, uh, level of resources uh, needs to be measured. Um, um, you know, equipment, um, resources needs to be allocated. Um, so those all has to be properly measured and documented. Um, so that wraps up my uh, presentation. Um, I'm open to any questions. Do you have any questions? Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your first presentation to Council. Jeffrey, you've been with us for a long time. That's surprising that you've, uh, this is your first time. How long have you been with the town of Exeter? Uh, seven years. Seven years. So you've seen us grow in terms of uh, asset management over that time, every, uh, amount of that time. Um, I was surprised to see some of the gaps that you've identified. Um, having said that, though, I do think that we are further ahead than many other communities who don't even have an asset management plan. So I think it's important to understand that context. Um, but a key point, and I think you brought that up, is uh, the asset management plan that we talk about is now five years old. Uh, based on the data, because that data was from 2017, adopted in 2018. Um, so would your recommendation being to maybe have a policy in place where that's updated, say, every five years, or do portions of it yearly, like focus on the water system and focus on uh, other assets? How would you, I guess, look at updating that in the future? Because it is a, it's a large document. Yeah, I, um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll give my... Uh suggestion first but maybe Clayton have um, something to, to add uh, but I think the uh, um, you know the asset management policy is is, is more like a, a governing document it, it specifies um, you know the rules and responsibilities of, of um, you know um, each department and, and, and even council and, and uh, each person um, um, you know, in terms of their role um, to, to, to better our asset management. The asset management plan is, is a document of a, a snapshot of our, of our assets at a given year. I think um, that can be done as a needed, as needed basis. Uh, but I do think the, you know, the asset management policy is actually the document that actually governs you know, when we want to, to do another, you know, asset management uh, plan or, or uh, you know, any other asset management uh, related activities. Um, so, yeah, I just want to have that, that kind of like hierarchy, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, explained. 
So, so Mr. Chair, I supplement that as well. I think to me, the key word here is plan versus system. So we, we use the word plan a lot here with our aspect of plan. Um, if the system is implemented the way that they're intended to be implemented, you probably shouldn't have to do that update every five years because you're updating constantly. Whenever you get a piece of data that changes in the field, it needs to be put in the asset management system, whether it's for maintenance, whether it's replacement, whether it's a new assessment of the condition, whatever it may be. So that's the ultimate. Um, until we get there, we may have to do some of these, and we are doing that, right? So the sanitary service assess condition is being done right now, next year storm. So we're doing some of that stuff, but I think um, you know that snapshot in time is a great thing to look at. But if, if we don't have a system in place to maintain it, um, yeah, we're not we're not there. We're, we're, we're getting there. I think your point, Mr. Mayor, about the fact that we're ahead of a lot of surprises is a very good one. Um, this isn't all lost. It's just we're just trying to reflect it. There's a lot of work here still. Um, um, we got a great start, but uh, it, it's a it's a system that the organization has to 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 um, it's basically we do work, and we're not there. Yet. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, follow up. yeah, if I could follow up, and I think you know to that point, I guess my question to to administration is, um, you know, we've we've come a long way. I remember when I was a counselor, we were talking about asset management, but nobody else was talking about asset management. Um, and here we are today, and some councils are just starting to kind of get on board with asset management planning because it's now part of the MGA. Um, so, do we need to start building into our yearly operational budget? a budget line just to do with um, um, dealing with the assessments and data entry uh, on a yearly basis. So I, I know that we've been doing like lots of one-offs. So one year we're doing a road assessment and then one year we're doing bridge bridge assessments where you have that $100,000 sitting there that you can you can allocate that each year uh, to make it more consistent. And so you can continue to build that data. And also like some of these, these recent uh, updates or recent assessments that we've done, like the road assessment survey, and I know we're doing the bridge assessments and culvert assessments right now. Is that data actually being put into this system or is that being put into a different system uh, someplace else? I, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused by that. So this is the part of the system part, certainly, Mr. Chair, that we're that I think we're still growing with. So great point. I asked the exact same question to Jeff probably about a month ago. <laughs> um, and the answer is no. So we've collected all this data and it's not, it's in a separate, separate system and it's not in our asset management system. So the learning for us is, is when we go out to ask itself to collect data for us, the first thing we say is you will deliver the data in this format based on our asset registry so we can import it into our asset management system. So, you know, these are learnings that, uh, that we're growing through, but uh, we, can, we, can, we can work and try to get it there. It's not, it's not all loss, it's data, um, but that's, you know, Jeff made the point about sometimes our data isn't all in one place yet. So we're, we got to get there because it's not helpful if we don't have all the data in one spot. Okay, Councillor Meyer okay. and then Councillor Presidio. Thanks, that's a good chair to uh, Jeffrey. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was lovely to finally see you here. Um, well done. Uh, my question is um, the mayor kind of alluded to some of it. Um, this one is about the uh, project schedule. So you've got three years listed here, um, anticipating that um, next year is year one. Is that correct um, on the plan? I think the year one thing is more like a, a general term um, that, okay. that they used. Uh, not necessarily say like 2023, um, like it could be 2024 also, but it kind of like, a, you know, it's more like a, um, a stage, like treated as a stage one, stage two, stage three um, thing too. Wow. But I mean, like if we, if we can do it next year, you know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, Just ahead, to follow, follow up. up on that, thank you. Um, so I, I hope that we can do it next year. Um, I really hope that. Um, I, I realize there's no uh, financial numbers next to any of these. I, I was quite observant of that. Um, are we going to be able to see what, like, what does all those different stages kind of like ballparkish cost so we can kind of anticipate those annual um, contributions that we need to be putting towards this, um, like as the mayor alluded to, right? It, it seems like we've had a lot of like kind of one-off things, and and you know, in, in my mind, you know, a one-off thing is like that's it, right? But then when it comes back, it's like well, we already had one. Um, so just having something kind of like in the budget that is you know consistent and predictable um, from our end as well, and I'm sure you guys would probably appreciate it too, um, because I, I would hope that we could finish this in three years. So that would be that would be nice. I, I like how that's laid out. Um, 
Um, so uh, to the chair, uh, maybe uh, Clayton, we can off. Senior strength is a great question. I think some of this stuff is, is probably internal administrative things that we just need to do the setting up the systems and the processes and the and, and to, 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 to build some of these things. I think the year one stuff is really foundational. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, this is going to get really technical, but it's data about your data. That's what yes. we got to build. Right? <laughs> That's what you're doing. You're building a database about your data. Say, here's the source. Here's when it needs to be updated. Here, here's who's responsible for updating it. Here's where it's stored. All that stuff needs to be done. We don't have that. And that's sort of this foundational stuff that, uh, that needs to be done. So um, I don't have an answer for the, the budgetary stuff. I think it's, uh, it's a really good one. Um, um, we'll have to have a really uh, hearty chat about that and see what, uh, what we may need to do to help uh, advance. We have until Saturday. Yeah, lots of stuff. Okay, you have a follow-up? No, Pat. Pat. Uh, no, actually, Pat. Pat, you have a question. Go ahead. Thanks. I just... Um... Pat Fisher, Senior Manager of Infrastructure. I just want to jump in on the year one, year two, year three portion of the continuity study. So we, we commissioned this continuity study last summer, um, just so that we could have some grounding going forward with how we're moving the asset management program forward. So some of those year one tasks are things that we've started already. So for example, um, collecting some of the data with the data gap analysis, We've been going through and finding pieces of data that are missing in our asset registry. For example, we didn't have any manholes listed on our sanitary system. So Jeff has been working on that in sort of the last year, going through and making sure that that's added back into our system and that everything's linked up properly. Things like catch basins were missing, and we've collected that data. So we've been doing a lot of those things um, and, and picking away at that internally with our, our own resources. That's actually been a bulk of what Jeff has been working on in the last year. And then in terms of um, things like building the, the systems for how we manage our data, Jeff has been working on a draft version of sort of a, an asset management procedure um, so that we can kind of update our system so we know how to update our system so we know how to collect data so we know who has access and all of these things and that's a, a kind of ongoing thing as well but it's sitting in a binder on my desk right now thank you okay, thank you councillor sits me yeah through the chair to administration a whole lot of talk about data and not in here not in there and getting the right format um, my question is our asset management program. Is it suffice? Is it up to date? It's compatible with industry standards. Um, I know from going to our conferences, there's a lot of asset management programs out there. Clearly some are better than others. Um, some have great ads where you can have alarms on your hydrants if they're getting water inside of them. Um, so how is our software? You know, are we are we decent? Is it a good one? Are we okay? Is it compatible? Or are we that kind of one of those things where you go, well, we have all this great data, but now we just need the program to bring it together. So we're both we sit with that. Yeah, to, to the chair, and I think uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Mayor Mayor also uh, mentioned this before. You know, we we we're actually quite advanced in terms of uh, you know having some sort of. Uh, asset management system. Uh, last conference that I went to, which is uh, Infrastructure Asset Management Alberta, um, they actually did a presentation, like the uh, government of Alberta, they actually did a, did a uh, presentation on their survey um, results for, um, you know, um, Alberta municipalities and, and, and how they're at with their um, asset management, and uh, as of 2021, um, I have the figures here. So still only 47% of councils, and that's municipal councils, of course, have an approved asset management strategy. So we're, we're, we're not the 47%. <laughs> um, and still only 24% of re uh, respondents have a formal asset management plan. So that's a very low number. Uh, we have one. We just need to, you know, better it and, and keep on working on it. Uh, but based on my conference experience and talking to, you know, other municipalities and uh, 
<clears throat> many, many municipalities, they, 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 they are still looking for a consultant to, to actually mm -hmm. start the, 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 the process. Mm -hmm. um, I believe um, the Alberta government um, set a, kind of like a time frame. I don't know if it has to be strictly followed, but I think it's between, um, they gave it until 2025. So, I mean, there are still three years and, and you know, some municipalities are, are only started looking into having a, um, their first asset management approach. So, so you know, we're, we're, we're not bad. Like we're, I, th I think we're, we have a good start. Um, now, you know, it just, we, we want to, to refine it, actually start using it. For our benefits. So. Okay, thank you, Pat. Go ahead. You have a follow up. True, true to share the, the councillor Kasichny. Um, in terms of our software capabilities, it's um, we're not using it to the full extent that it can be done. It has the ability to integrate with our maps. It has the ability to integrate with all of these other pieces of data that we're not using. Um, it's currently linked with our financial system. We do we are keeping our finance records and our asset records separate for now, but there is. A lot of functionality in the software. I think it can do everything that we need it to do, um, which is not resourcing appropriately. Perfect. Maybe if I can add to yes, that, uh, um, I guess in terms of the industry standard, um, that's where the the quote that I included um, uh, kicks in. I think that's the standard. That's that's um, not even an industry standard. That's you know, that's a standard that every uh, person using or developing the asset management plan or system process has to follow. It's just, um, I think three key, or I'm just counting in my head, but some of the keys are just, um, you know, level of service. Um, you know, they have to be determined. They have to be measured. They have to be reviewed um, on a, um, you know, yearly basis or, or, or you know, um, or have a set time period for continuous um, review of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think the, the 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 measure part is is I I think personally I think that's the most important thing. Um, you know, we measure measure data, measure governance, measure um, resources, um, like you know just. You want to know where you're at, and 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 um, um, again, it's not a it's not a once for all and we're done thing. It it you know as long as there's infrastructure and and you know extreme weather and stuff like that, uh, it's going to change. You know our assets going to change, our system is going to update or 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 degrade, or so we have to just keep an eye on it and and actually follow it. So. Okay, thank you for answering question, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you. And I and I think that's the key thing to remember. This is a lead, uh, living, breathing system um, that's all constantly going to be changing. Um, I just want to ensure from, from a council level, obviously, we don't deal with the meat and the potatoes as you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes we don't have a really good understanding where we are from an organizational uh, standpoint. So I really appreciated this, this presentation. Um, but I want to ensure that we have the resourcing available. So we are using this to our full advantage because I think from a financial uh, systems approach uh, and long-term planning for our community, that data and that information is going to be key for us to be successful moving forward in investment in the community. Investing into our asset management plan and the resources into the asset management plan, I think we're going to pay big dividends to us uh, moving forward because I think governments, they're going to be starting to ask, okay, you want to apply for you you're asking for five million dollars ten million dollars what does your asset management play plan say is it a part of your your plan mm -hmm. um and that tracking that tracking and that uh uh reporting back pieces is, is a, a key part of our strategic plan as well because we want to see those benchmarks and so we can see where we are and how we're progressing so uh i challenge administration to come back to us with you know what if you could have it all what, what would that look like? And then the reality of what can we afford and what can we do, uh, which are, are obviously two different things, but um, things like the road assessment survey, 
bringing all that information and in, I think it's critical. We spent that money, let's make sure it's in, in our system. And if, if that means we have to go back to that company and say, how much is it gonna cost you to convert this data to bring it into our system? And we need to know that, but we should learn from that and make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, and on the on the software piece, I think we've only been using Citywide for one or two years, right? We just- uh, No, actually, you know, actually we, we started like back in uh, 2016, we already started using it. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, as, as Pat mentioned before, we were just, we're not using it to its full capacity. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's because of the various reasons that I already give, but it, it has all the cap capabilities of, of a proper uh, asset management system um, requires. Uh, we just have to, to, to actually, you know, use it to, to its full potential. And I know a lot of municipalities uh, actually um, is looking to use citywide as, as well. Um, so it's, it's quite, uh, that's the industry standard part two, at least they're growing in Alberta. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other new questions for Jeffrey? Hey, if not, thank you for your presentation and we look forward to seven years seeing you again. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, I didn't want to make you stay. <laughs> no? I can. <laughs> it's required. Okay, well, if uh, Pat needs you, because um, our next one is D3, Water System Overview, Pat Fisher. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Long time no talk, guys. Yeah. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about the water system, um, just give you a bit of an update. Um, and that's the primary purpose is we're coming into our budget workshop slash meeting on Saturday. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of context for some of the stuff that you'll see added to our capital plan, just sort of as a uh, result of um, this stuff, for lack of a better word. So I'm going to kind of go through a high level system overview so you kind of understand how the system works if you haven't seen it or haven't had any familiarity with it recently. Review our regulatory framework, review some of the, the challenges that I see um, just having uh, worked with the operations crew and doing capital in the last two years, and then um, some of the capital plan recommendations that I would have and that you will see incorporated into the five year capital plan. So in town, we actually use well water. We have uh, a bunch of wells kind of located around town. There's eight in service generally. Um, and then we've got a, a number that are unavailable for um, due to regulatory purposes, requiring additional treatment, or just needing some equipment. Um, each one of those wells basically has its own treatment plant built into it. So we do treatment at each one of those wells. We don't operate one water treatment plant. We operate a dozen all the way around the community. Um, they all communicate with each other um, through instrumentation. We check them daily. We have to check them daily in order to comply with legislation. So, and then, sorry, I just want to clarify. Yeah. Um, that means if an operator gets in a truck and visits one of these sites every day, I think it's clear, I think just make sure it's clear to council if that's the level of service. It's a, it's a person driving to these daily. To get the context. Yeah. Um, the treatment systems are fairly simple comparatively, but they still require um, monitoring like that. Sorry, I'm just going to Does that yeah. include weekends too, or you just text? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, um, we have one centralized storage area at Grand Prairie Trail. Um, so on 63rd Street near 17th Ave, there's two big round tanks above ground. Basically, our whole system works like a water tower. So um, as the water level in those tanks comes down, the water pressure in our system drops, and we start turning on these water treatment plants. As the water level increases, we start turning them off again. So um, 
basically what happens is as the water level comes down, especially when we're using a lot in the summer, we have challenges with pressure in certain areas of town. Basically anything along the north edge where um, elevation is higher, um, we have sort of reduced pressure, especially um, during peak flow and as the water level comes down. Um, in terms of regulatory framework, we have uh, two major documents that apply to us. We have a, a water system approval. This is from Alberta Environmental Parks under the Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act. This lets us operate our distribution system and provide potable water to our residents. And we have a water diversion license also issued by Alberta Environmental Parks under the Water Act, it's a different act. This lets us actually take water out of the groundwater aquifers and use it for the purpose of providing the resource supply. Each one of these um, basically comes with a set of requirements for the operating approval. It formally requires us to follow standards and guidelines that are set by AEP. So there's a, a five part document basically outlines operating requirements, um, treatment requirements, types of treatment that you can use, um, monitoring requirements, all of that sort of stuff. Anything we need to do to upgrade has to comply with those standards. Any time we need to do an extension, replacement, modification has to comply with those standards. It also establishes other requirements for extension, including the requirement to have an engineer involved in the design um, and uh, the requirement for us to certify that we have adequate treatment if we are extending or expanding the system, that we have adequate supply to provide water to those new service areas without causing any issues. It sets limits um, for parameters that we have to monitor daily, fluoride, total organic carbon, stuff like that. Um, it also sets monitoring requirements. So again, it requires us to go in every day and do a check, collect samples, do tests, send stuff out to the lab for third-party tests. It requires certified operators. Um, they have to be trained, much like a trade skills person or a uh, skilled trades person in Alberta. Our operators are all certified by Alberta Environmental Parks. We have to require, they have training, they have ongoing education requirements, um, and we have to maintain that. Um, it also includes requirements for reports, plans, and other documents to comply with future legislation. So annually, we're required to do a report. Monthly, we're required to submit reports. We're required to submit plans for meeting future regulatory requirements, and I'm going to talk a little bit later. And um, also, how tell our environment how we're going to meet those requirements. We also have the Water Act license. It provides the approval to use the water or withdraw it from the ground. It establishes a different set of monitoring or reporting requirements. Reporting requirements. There's monthly and annual, annual testing. There's a requirement for us to have a third party um, hydrogeologist do uh, a report and submit it to Alberta Environment every year on the state of our aquifer, how sustainable our withdrawal limits are, um, and how the aquifer is performing. Um, not all of the wells that we're actually certified for or, or approved for are usable. Some of them um, are historical wells that we can no longer use. Um, so we are currently licensed to produce 85 liters per second. We can only produce 46 liters as a second in practice. Some of that's due to those licensing requirements where we have well that we can't use. Some of it is due to wells that um, we can use, we are using, but we aren't extracting every bit of water out of it that we could. So there's some optimization that could happen or should happen for some of those wells. Um, some of the issues you might see, missing equipment. So two of the wells that we can't use are missing pumps, they're not pumps. Um, high levels of fluoride, two of the wells that we can't use have fluoride levels that exceed Canadian guidelines for drinking water quality. We don't have the ability to blend them within limits. One of the wells has a bacterial issue that we can't treat with the treatment system that's uh, there. Um, and some of them require additional treatment that we just don't have in soil. So um, three of the wells, 18, 22, and 24, are our biggest producers. Those three wells produce more than 60% of our water production. When one of those goes down, we're in trouble. The summer we had 24 go down due to uh, 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 some damage to the well casing. And we were under water restrictions for almost a month as a result. Um, 
that the, the reliance on those three wells in particular is a, a concern moving forward into the future. And I'll elaborate on that one a little bit later. Are those mm -hmm. three wells located in the same general area as well? Mm -hmm. Are they not? No, they're, okay. they're spread out. Okay, so two of them are near CN. I'm gonna go look them up real quick. So well, 22 and 24 are located here. And then well, 18 is located outside the town in the county. So well, 17. We do, it's over here. It's not a very big producer though. Okay, so that's sort of our regulatory frame. That's the, we must comply with them. Um, um, going into challenges with our water system. I think the, uh, we've got four that I've identified here. There's a couple of other lesser ones that don't affect the capital planning, um, but our current water treatment capacity is insufficient in the more detail. Sections of piping and water system are past their useful life. Um, there are future regulatory changes coming and we have some pr pressure fluctuations that cause user complaints that we should probably do something about. <laughs> Being warm. I, we were, uh, I'll just work. hang on one second and solve a problem in this guy's cart. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of capacity, we don't have enough water production capacity to meet what's called max day and peak hour demands. Um, those are defined by Alberta Environment and Parks. Basically, based on our population, um, you can calculate that. And we're required to meet um, 68 and 102 liters a second respective, respectively for those. We can make 46 liters a second. So we're less than max day, right? Max day is typically uh, the water demand you would experience when you've got a really hot, dry period. Everyone's watering their lawns. Um, we wouldn't have any restrictions with that max day es estimate, right? That's just a, a guess at how much water people would generally use. Um, so because we're short, what happens is we have water restrictions during the summer. We shut down the Sprite Park, we implement odd even watering, we stop watering uh, for a period of time this summer. We set up restrictions on our bulk water station. Um, so, so there's some very immediate impacts to our community. That's going to be an ongoing thing until we fix our capacity concern. That's true. That's... Do you want to be interrupted as you're going? Is that not a problem? Okay, go ahead. Come Except for the chart to pass. Uh, so the, the gap that we're missing there between that 46 and the 68 mm -hmm. uh, liters per second, um, in, in the screen you had before where you said we're missing some pumps and we've got some, some uh, more um, uh, filtering required, uh, you know, to kind of like bring some of those up to date. Um, if, if we had that, would we close that gap or do we like need more water wells? We would close the gap for okay. a while. For a while. Okay. For a while. And, and I'll go into that. That's a future thing, uh, future okay. problem. Um, so, so that there's regulatory changes that are going to impact our. I.e., not Pat's problem. <laughs> you don't know that. You don't know that. Um, you live here. <laughs> I still live here. That's right. I'm still going to live here. Um, so we make. Um, so that that's that's the immediate needs. Our residents feel that they're going to keep feeling that. Um, one of the other things that we don't really link to this water capacity thing is the challenges with approving new development, right? If we had a new subdivision come into town, um, in order to approve that subdivision, we have to say, and we have to certify to Alberta Environment and as part of the subdivision that we can provide water for that subdivision. We can't do that. We're not meeting max day. So that's a challenge, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very big challenge for bringing in the kinds of things that we want to do. Yeah. yeah. So question historically through the chair, uh, has that max day number changed or have we just reduced the amount of um, water we've been able to produce over the years just based on conditions? Or have we never been at the point where we've been able to meet the max day because we've... <laughs> so, through the chair to uh, Mayor Sarah, the, the, the challenge is I don't think that we have um, actually been able to meet Max Day for quite a while. So 
Um, luckily or unluckily, we haven't had a lot of development that's required it um, since I think the last big one was going to phase two, and that was quite a while ago. That's fine. Go ahead. Thanks. That's for the chair to Mr. Fisher. Um, I, maybe my memory is is incorrect here, but I, I thought when we approved the well for Vision Park that that was like a slam dunk for our water system. Is that not quite right? Really the chair to Council Fire. It's a really key thing to improving our water capacity. It adds about seven liters a second, which gets us closer to that max state. Mm -hmm. um, if nothing else changes. <laughs> if nothing else changes, that's how it's. Um, there, there's other things that I think we will spend time doing, but that's that's a a, a good piece. It's a approved well. It was the right decision, and mm -hmm. it still is the right decision to have some more treatment up there. Council sure. Moore, mm -hmm. go ahead, Council Moore. Uh, through the chair, Pat. Uh, how much pressure was put on our system by having all the work crews in town and uh, the different water uh, requirements from them? through the chair to council more that's actually a very big um topic because that's not included in those numbers there max mm -hmm. day so it add, does add a significant amount of stress um operationally um so so the max day and the peak hour are typically based on 350 liters per person per day um uh, for our population, so 8,400, give or take a, a little bit of change. When you've got a bunch of temporary workers in town um, filling up the hotels and adding demand like that, it can put a, a pretty high demand. So when we're full up and there was a period of time where some of the hotels were even double booked, our per capita use was closer to 450 liters per person per day on our published population. So it's, it's quite a big increase. Mm -hmm. And we actually see that on our wastewater system as well um, at the wastewater treatment plant. The additional population coming in puts an additional load on the wastewater plant as well. Follow up on that, Pat, where you talked about development, but didn't we factor it in if we're putting in a motel with 80 rooms? Wouldn't that be figured in that, that full capacity? Through the chair to the chair, yeah, you're supposed to. Um, I don't know. <laughs> 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 wasn't a yes. Yeah. Okay, anyway, that was just a nice car. Wait a minute. Uh, count, you're done, Councillor Taylor. Yeah, through the chair, Mr. Fisher. Um, th this, the issue that we're, we're seeing with the max peak day and, and being under suspicion, is this a, a problem uh, unique to us or is this a problem you see to a lot of municipalities in Alberta? Uh, are there those that are we like at the bottom? section of municipalities in terms of, of hitting this, where are we in the standard of that? To the Go ahead. chair, to Council Taylor. I am not sure that there's a standard on this. Well, the standard is that we should be able to produce max day yeah. peak hour. Yeah. Um, we're not the only community that has experienced water restrictions or water mm -hmm. challenges like this. Okotoks went through it. Um, they had severe restrictions in terms of their treatment capacity that were limiting development as well. Um, Beaumont was uh, having periods of that through sort of 2006 through 2012, um, where they had water bans, lots of restrictions, and they built another reservoir to, to store water for themselves. So um, not unique. Um, I don't have a whole lot of Thank you. Just one follow up one thing, Bob. So, if we can increase the wells, you just nailed it. So, if we put in more storage, would that help bring our numbers up? Because I was saying, if we're drilling wells having problems, if we added storage, as we said, the other place, would that help us? Through the chair, through the chair. Yeah, it could. There would be um, some assessments on. Um, how much storage would be required that would be needed. That's uh, basically a full modeling exercise based on demand, how fast everything replenishes um, to kind of establish that. Um, it's probably cheaper to, to put more wells on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Council Byron. Thanks. That's from the chair to you, Mr. Fisher. So th th this particular slide is quite interesting. Um, so 
we, we need to essentially increase our water production by 50%. Do we have a timeline that we are required to do that by? We just wouldn't be able to have any new developments. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Persistence. I'll see you, Chair Mr. Fisher. My memory serves me correctly. You drilled a few wells that produced tons of water and had manganese in it. Um, is that still posing a challenge or is there ways of removing the manganese so that as well as can make them useful? Through the chair to Council Persistence. Um, that's actually what we're doing at Vision Park, is one of the wells that had a high level of production but has high levels of manganese. We're putting in treatment there. With the design for Vision Park, we did include some provisions that that facility could take on additional wells in the future if we put them up there. Um, but we don't have any additional licensed wells up there currently. Anyone has anything new? Dick, carry on. So that's uh, sort of item challenge number one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Challenge number two is we've got some old pipe yeah. mics on. Um, so in town, we've got um, some of our oldest pipes are 70 year old and 90 year old cast iron pipes that are still in service. Um, these are kind of nearing the end of their life. What happened with cast iron pipe is, is the, the 90 year old pipe kind of aged out at the same time as the 75 year old pipe because of there was a, a design standard change. Um, so both of those are coming close to the end of their life or at the end of their life. What that means is as it is approaching the end of its life, it becomes more brittle, more susceptible to breakage. Um, so that's a, a thing that we deal with. You also have a significant amount of scaling, smaller diameter piping. Um, and the, the key here is that these pipes are underneath some of our worst sections of road. So 7th Ave, 8th Ave, 9th Ave, we, we get the most complaints about the quality of our road surfaces. That's where we find a lot of this older piping. Um, so that's, that's one of the other challenges that um, we have here. It affects kind of the rest of our capital program because on some of those roads where we really want to do something, there's a very high likelihood that if we paved over 8th Ave, for example, We'll have to be back there and repair a water line break, right? Um, we did a repair on 7th Ave this summer. We've done a repair on 9th Ave already this spring. Last year, we did several repairs on 50th Street. So this, 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 is, this is fairly current. Um, and I don't know if, if this is all of the extents of the oldest piping. Um, but this certainly exists in the, the corridor here. So one of the things that I would recommend to work through this is um, consider some neighborhood renewals, right? On um, 7th Ave or 8th Ave, if you want to get in there and do the roads, um, we're actually, we would recommend doing a deep utilities work and then following up the year after with the rotating. So that's a, Similar to what was being done a couple of years ago by the town, um, up on 17th Ave, um, we did that uh, sort of a deep utilities repair and then came back and paved it. We did it along 5th Ave on quite an extensive portion. So that kind of work is something that we should definitely consider. So there's a, a couple of those recommended in the capital plan for some of the worst areas. Problem number three that I think we got is future regulatory issues. And uh, issues is a wrong word. Future regulatory changes. So what's happened in the last year is that we've had a change in the potable water regulation. Um, and Alberta has adopted a new standard for fluoride that didn't previously apply in the province. Um, so under our operating approval with Alberta Environment, we're required to submit a plan on how we're going to meet that standard in 2023. And then we're going to have to be fully compliant by 2027 with that standard. So that means um, it affects water output from three of our wells that are currently in use. Those are 18, 19, and 20. So those are the three that are outside of town. Um, they get blended together. Um, one of those is our big water producer. 
It requires either treatment to comply with the new standard, replacement with a, a different kind of water um, well, like a, a higher quality groundwater well, um, or um, taking it offline if we're not done anything by 2027. So um, currently um, we've started a sustainability study on our aquifer that'll tell us if we can and where we can anticipate being able to support additional capacity with our groundwater system. And that will inform sort of where we go with that. If we can replace a drill a new well, that might be cheaper than building a treatment system, for example. And that would be what we would do. If we have to do um, uh, a new treatment system, there's quite a bit of capital required to that. So we put a placeholder in the budget because we didn't know what that plan would specifically look like, but we did include uh, an estimate for building the plan and submitting it to Alberta Environment in 2023. Um, challenge number four, and this is all I'm going to cover today, is the water system yeah. pressures. <laughs> pressures <on. laughs> I'm trying to see, we're, we're, we're making action plans here. So you actually actually might drop as he heads up the door. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so we have a pressure zone in the north area of town, zone two. Um, primarily, that's Tiffin, um, basically everything north of 13th Ave um, and west of Edson Drive. Um, we had some issues in 2017 with the mm -hmm. station. Um, currently, only one of the five pumps that are in the building are operable. Um, if we have... Uh, That's not noticeable at all. Hmm? <laughs> As he fills his watch cover. If we, if we turn off the pump, we get a lot of complaints. Um, so um, there's also an associated pressure regulating valve station located just south of Edson Drive on 48th Street. That is not functioning. It was built at the same time as the pump house. Um, the issues that we had in 2017 are basically the same issues that we had for the weeks in 2020. We've been there twice already. Um, uh, the recommendation, there was a, uh, weren't really sure what to do, either abandon zone two or refurbish it. Um, based on the number of complaints that came in when we turn it off, I actually think we would recommend refurbishing it. That'd be going in, making sure all the pumps are up to date, fixing the piping issues and refurbishing the, the PRV station that is not currently functioning. Um, so that's a, a thing that shows up in the, the capital plan that we're going to propose at the budget meeting. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Our favorite topic, the Tiffany pump house mm -hmm. debacle. Um, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, we only have one pump operating there because we're concerned about too much pressure on that pipe that was repaired in 2017. Is that correct? Or is it just because those pumps are so old now that they're just not operational? Through the chair of two mirrors of heart, uh, there's a couple of issues. I think that's the primary issue is related to the pressure concerns. Um, what happened is one of the pipes underneath the foundation spring week and we did a temporary fix on it to get it back into service um, but my understanding is that there's also some controls and operational issues in the building that definitely needed a bit of a facelift as well at this point in time that station was built in 1982 it's actually older than i am um, they're not really made to live and operate that long without some sort of major retrofit so um, so those are the, the four challenges. I think we kind of went over the capital recommendations briefly. Um, the groundwater exploration sustainability, determine if our aquifer can support additional high quality wells, expand our uh, treatment capacity of our system, optimizing our existing well field, um, seeing if we can drill and treat more, and um, see how we can deal with fluoride in the future. Um, look at some neighborhood renewals so we can deal with some of those old pipes under the worst roads. Um, this will actually improve fire flow in town, reduces our risk of breaks, emergency call-outs, overtime. Um, fix some bumpy roads. Fix some bumpy roads. Uh, fix the worst of our bumpy roads. Um, 
plan for and implement mitigation measures for the new regulatory changes. This could be new wells, could be retrofitting our existing wells, this could be adding treatment systems. Um, that plan still has yet to be developed, but we've got some money proposed in the capital plan for developing that plan so that we can figure out how we're going to fix it. And then fixing the uh, booster station, associated PRV station. I think it's a, an important thing for us to do for those neighborhoods in the northern part of the county. Questions? How far is this to be a more? Um, for some reason, I thought we did the pipe on Main Street, but the north side it was paved back in 2011. Um, and if I recall correctly, the, the lines off it that were highlighted were scheduled a few years back, but um, I've seen the map a lot worse, so it's actually not as bad as it's <laughs> I get, I get been around long The first time I saw that map, I was like, oh, but it's, it's doable and, and it's important. So um, the question I kind of had though is, our, um, you're talking about studying the aquifer again, and I know we spent a decade, over decades, studying our aquifer. We have tons of studies, and at the time, I mean, we were the second largest community on wells. So, um, the in the aquifer studies at that time says you're way better off on wells because they're more sustainable in drought years. Um, there was all kinds of results of that study, but so do, with that, and I know we had wells all throughout the county, and we had test wells, and so people go, "Why is your John Hudson truck way out on the Grand Prairie Trail?" Well, it's because we have a well out there. Um, so. With that study being said, and knowing the information of the aquifers in our region, and I do know, uh, and it drives me mental um, when they throw regulations at us and don't give us the money to meet the regulations. This is a you new, know, the contact time and the, the extra big shacks was one of those, hey, here you go, and we have all these wells, and now we're new regulation, and we're trying to find money we didn't have. So that doesn't surprise me. Now, nothing's changed, nothing changes. Um, but again, can we not use that report, or do we really have to study all this aquifer again? Like that to me seems like we have a pile of data on it, it's been compiled. Um, and the chair go ahead, yeah. Council Pasichini. Um, so, some of the information that we require from a regulatory perspective is missing from a lot of those, the, the previous mm -hmm. assessments. They changed the rules. <laughs> so, we are currently using this as a way to collect that data so we can answer the questions that we need to answer every year in terms of how well we're performing, uh, what the aquifer is actually doing long term. Um, and uh, the thing that was really surprising that I could not find in those documents was uh, a hard, here is what you could withdraw from the aquifer to support development. There was no hard number that, that would existed in those reports that I could find. Yeah, and they further, I, I don't remember a hard number. I do know the, the, the synopsis of the, the coast notes version of what we were told was that it, you know, like there, there's tons of water in the ground around us and then you can sustain your community and you're better off than trying to go to the river because rivers can dry up. Um, and then the, the, the understanding, unfortunately, it's got fluoride in it, but well, like the well 18, those three wells were supposedly in, in drag feet from the river. So they're getting water from the surface. But they're far enough from the river that we're not having to do surface treatment on it. Now, I don't know if that says that the reports or not. That's just how my memory serves me. But I do know that we've punched several wells in this community, and Magnes always seems to be a hit on it. Like, because it was a well we did on top of the. Uh, be almost in line with Main Street, but over by the group home on the, just off Edson Drive, we drilled, we drilled the well off the road there. That was a lot of water too, but it had name I believe in that one as well, did it not? Through the chair to position. So um, lots to unpack in that. Um, so we have a whole system of aquifer like it's, it's an aquifer system, not just one aquifer that, that we will draw from. Um, recently, we set up a whole management area around the town. Um, and that's, that's our aquifer management area. It's part of our license now. It simplifies the way we administer our license, but part of the, the trade-off is that we're required to give AP a lot more data than we have historically in terms of how much we're withdrawing, how much the water levels in the aquifer are actually changing. And um, if you look back over the last 20 years, I think that the, 
level is sort of steadily decreasing. So there's a, an appropriate limit to come out of the aquifer. And I don't think we've been told that yet. Thank you, Councilor Moore. Uh, through the chair and Pat. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when I was still working at the paper, I believe the town uh, did a recharge from the McLeod River into the well system to, to bring up the water levels and, and the wells. Uh, can you see that as a as a possibility sometime in the future? Through the chair to Councilor Moore. I think the last time that that was done was in the 90s, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, since then, there's actually been quite a significant amount of regulation change. So the ability to do that wouldn't exist anymore. What would happen is if we recharged our aquifer network with river water, um, depending on which wells were being injected and the transit time to them, there's a, a very high risk that we could have what's called groundwater under the direct, under the influence, um, which requires a whole level of treatment, which we're not actually set up for currently. So I don't think that that's an option. One question to you. Um, how expensive is it to get a filtering plant for magnesium? Like, can you remove magnesium from the water? Magnesium. Magnesium. Or magnet? Not magnesium. Manganese. Manganese? To the chair. Uh, manganese is um, removed. Mm, that's what we're doing with Vision Park. So Vision yeah. Park, we're getting a, a well system for currently seven and a half liters per second, and it's about three million bucks. Three million dollars for one treatment plant. That was cheaper to drill wells. Well, if you need less treatment. That's well, even with the question of drilling wells, like, because we drill a well and they cost, what, $25,000, $30,000 to fill a well? No, it's, because more than, it's more than that. Okay, it's significantly so, more than that. It's about $100,000 to just get all of the studies done. Um, that doesn't include, in order for us to use that water, we still need treatment. So if we don't have treatment capacity elsewhere and can get it to treatment, we still have to build a treatment. Well, the only question I have is, so instead of spending all the money is, with modern technology, can they drill a small hole and test before we spend a fortune drilling a hell to go, oh God, we've got lots of water, but we can't use it. There's no way of testing first. Uh, I think that's what our operations crew had historically done. They spent about $300,000 a year drilling test holes all over right. the place. Um, but I think that there's a, a better way to do it for the town, which is to study, to say, this is where you should drill. And this is where you've got the best chance of getting high quality water. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious on that thing about uh, Councilor Taylor. Yeah, so Mr. Chair, Mr. Fisher, um, you know, reading your report and, and listening to the presentation, you just makes me go, oh, crap. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. uh, now in the report, and you didn't mention it in the presentation, you do have investigate feasibility of water recycling at Kingston Spray Park feature. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I want to bring this kind of rooms up because it's something we have spoken about. Uh, informally, uh, wondering your thoughts on this, and I don't know if this solves our problem or just puts a puts a bandaid on it, uh, or just gets us closer. Go ahead. Move the chair to council chair. I totally missed that part that I put it in the RFD and didn't include it in the presentation. So I'm sorry about that. No. Um, our spray park, when it's in full use, um, when we're not restricting the hours and it's hot and it's there's people there all day, it can use up. It can account for up to twenty percent of our water use as a uh, in total. So it's it's a, a fairly significant piece. Um, in the last couple of years, we've had some changes to our operating hours. We've um, played with different times for restrictions as we need them. And we actually went in and adjusted all of the flow rates on each one of the features in the park to kind of bring our water use down. But it's still fairly significant. Um, implementing recycle might be a, a, something that would be worthwhile to look at. If you can do it cheaper than bringing on a new well, saving water is a lot easier than finding it. 
Go ahead, follow up. Uh, so the follow up is to administration. Uh, and again, I know we've talked about this informally, but now we're looking at what I would consider a facility enhancement. If we're enhancing the spray pump, right? Or making it like green efficient in some way. Are there perhaps grants available to help with this, whether it be matching grants or things like that? Because if that's an option, again, I'm pretty sure there's none for drilling wells or other things like that. As Transfer System has indicated, the regulations change and we'll just dump with the cost. But this, this one's unique in a way that it's, it's, a, it's a facility that's used, it's a recreation facility that's used. And just throwing out as an option, if that's something we could explore. Councilor Sitchin. Or Pat, you want to answer his question first and then you're up next. Through, through the chair to Councilor Taylor. Um, I think the first step probably starts with feasible, fe feasibility. Okay. Is this a feasible alternative? Okay. And what would that cost? And then and then from there, if it is feasible, and you can say, well, we've got all these green potential things in, you might be able to find some money associated with it. Uh, but I think, I think that's the part that you probably would start with. Sure. Not. No, just get, okay, fair enough. Let's hear. Councilor Sitchin. Just to put it in perspective, when they built the park, it was then, that was quite a while ago, it was an additional $250,000 for water treatment. Um, that also has an operational cost because now you need a pool operator to operate that to make sure the chemicals. And it goes one step further, which are the municipalities didn't realize when they put in recyclers, is now where's your shower facilities because you have to be able to wash that off of you. So uh, you not only put in a recycler, you got to put in showers and change and all that other kind of stuff. It goes it's like running a pool. Yeah. So that's why a lot of them, they, they locate them beside a pool, and then you can have the staff right there to launch the levels. And so. Okay, Councilor Byer. Uh, to the chair too, Pat. Um, so, so we have had this <clears throat> conversation a little informally. Um, I, I was under the perspective that if we were to recycle the spray park, spray park water, that it wouldn't necessarily be going back into the same facility, that it could be used for the street sweeper or watering plants or other maybe non-potable usages. Is, do, do, do we already have other non-potable water sources for those um, pieces? Like watering the flowers and and street sweepers, or 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 is that maybe an option? Um, through through the chair to your up here, um, I, I think there are opportunities for that, but I don't think that we use that much water per mm -hmm. on a, on a daily basis. That that's where our justification for recycling our, our water is. Just some preliminary research that um, that I've done with when it comes to this um, idea is um, there's there's other communities that have looked at um, including a, another water treatment plant, if you will, and they moved away from it because it was about a million dollars. It was over a million dollars, and so they're actually looking at doing exactly what you said of putting a tank in the ground just to capture. But it's it depends on the usage, and that's another aspect where they use enough where it would be utilized in a different way. So there are different things, you know, obviously this whole evening is about sharing um, our uh, infrastructure challenges that we have. Um, there seems to be a theme here, but um, it's essentially all of this takes time to research, but just uh, you know, from, the, from the outset, that feasibility is of whether or not this is a, a good option for us, but on the scale of all the things that we're managing, we're, We've got our recommendations that we're, we're looking at for sure. Mr. Mayor, uh, just on uh, the 7th, um, 8th, 9th Avenue, I think that we've got 70 or 70 to 90 years of life out of those pipes. I think we've got our money's worth. Um, so I think uh, definitely it's, you know, we've talked about 7th Ave. Um, unfortunately, we're hit with a lot of emergency infrastructure projects in one year. Um, so 7th Ave got punted down to the bottom of the list as we dealt with those emergent issues. Um, Bench Creek being one of them, another one of our favorite infrastructure projects we love talking about. So um, yeah, looking forward to, to budget and uh, maybe the, the new premium will 
will grace us with loads <laughs> of money flying from the sky with all the money that's going to be saved from all the rail services apparently. So, um, but I think a key point, a key point um, is that the regulatory changes uh, that seem to be nonstop, uh, we've seen it with the wastewater treatment plants, um, see it with water systems. Governments like to talk about reducing red tape and making things more efficient, but in the background, it's quite the opposite. And they are straddling municipalities with more and more and more. Um, and it's unfortunate. And I don't know if this is coming from Health Canada or um, the federal government uh, fed through to the provinces, or if these are provincial initiatives. I don't know if you have any insight on that, uh, Mr. Fisher. Through the chair to Mayor Zahara. So the fluoride regulation change, um, Alberta is the last uh, jurisdiction to actually adopt um, the, the maximum acceptable um, content for um, fluoride in Canada. Every other province has already adopted a uh, more stringent standard as far as that's concerned. Um, and in our system, because it's naturally occurring in our groundwater, um, we were, um, the, the province had kept an exemption in the potable water regulation for communities like ours, um, where it was naturally occurring to permit that use to still happen. And that's just going away, but we are the last jurisdiction in Canada to, to make that change. Have we beat him up enough? You're done with your presentation. Wait, you up? What? I, what? I <laughs> so, so I don't want to leave on a negative note. Um, one thing that I, I really don't like. Um, one thing that you'll see in our capital five-year capital plan that we want to bring forward is some plans to help through this. So it's there. So you can look. We can have a discussion. We can try and find some money. We can plan ahead. So it's not a last minute. Thing. So I think that's Councillor Taylor and then Mayor Zahara. Yeah, to the chair and, and Mayor Zahara indicated that about seventh and tenth, and I'm glad you mentioned about creating a plan because uh, this that's been a discussion at this table. You know, even though I've been only here for a year, is creating that plan of what you want to do next, and not just doing it piecemeal or just like thinking about a long term plan something that we can share with the community when people ask about roads and of course that's probably the bigger thing that people notice they don't notice the pipes underneath until it's yeah. until it's too late right so and and we look at those types of things and we hit essentially two birds or three birds with one stone doing that work it makes a lot of sense so uh, i'm glad we're thinking about those plans i'm anxious to see what what administration is going to bring to us in the next few days here um so we can start thinking in the future of how we're going to tackle this this issue so. yeah. uh thank you pat for identifying all these uh challenges and uh thank you to miss Pittner, who's gonna not find us the money because there is no money <laughs> <That's right. laughs> to address it um but as we leave i just want to thank you for your service to the town of edson uh you've been a critical a part of our operations here and we're very sad to see you leave uh the town of Edson but uh, glad that you're gonna be sticking around town so it's not too late we can walk them in <laughs> thank you Pat and thank you for your years of service and I'm glad you're staying and you live Sorry. on 7th Avenue I live, I live in town I'm <laughs> on, on 7th Avenue I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to live in town Go ahead, Christine so just to note, so the capital plan is not, or the capital budget is not coming on the 15th, just so oh, everyone's aware we're only doing the operating budget on the 15th. Just want to make sure that there's an disappointed uh, council members when we set up the agenda. Yes, my apologies. Okay, we're done then. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Moving on. Moving on, no corporate services, no community. So we are going to G, Alberta Muni, and we'll make it simple. We'll start on this end with Mr. Moore. And we'll, we'll, we'll be giving your conference reports. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be fairly brief, I think. Um, yeah, as, uh, as the very first one I took in last year in Edmonton, and this one was in Calgary, 
uh, very, very important for all counselors, especially first year counselors. Uh, a great chance to network with uh, with not only mayors but uh, fellow counselors, and you find out that uh, you know we uh, we think we have problems here and successes, but you know they have the very same thing. You know, we can talk about the very same uh, topics and uh, issues, which is uh, which is certainly good to know. Um, I got there a day early to take in uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, courses, which was. Uh, which was um, a small town uh, strategy. So actually council's role in public engagement, which is very important. That was uh, the first day and it, uh, it went mostly all day, but it was uh, very good, uh, uh, very interesting exercises to uh, keep, us, keep us on top of things. Uh, went to two, um, two uh, uh, seminars the next day, uh, small town strategies uh, beyond viability the secret sauce of, um, of thriving small communities. And these are smaller communities than we have, but uh, certainly the issues were, uh, and challenges were the same. And uh, uh, another session that I took in later was, uh, was called uh, Laughing Matters, which is uh, pretty important. I think uh, in today's world, uh, uh, having a sense of humor is very important uh, and it gets you, uh, Gets you by uh, and a lot of things. This was uh, CBC personality uh, uh, Peter Brown, who uh, took us through a lot of uh, great, uh, great humor and uh, and situations. And um, we had uh, the mayor will probably uh, uh, talk about this, but I'll just mention it in, in passing. We had a couple of uh, good meetings with uh, Minister of Health, uh, Mr. Copping. And of course, uh, uh, social services minister Luan, and uh, they were very encouraging meetings for sure. And then the trade show is always interesting because you see what's uh, what's new and perhaps what's not new, but it's all it's all uh, it all is linked in with uh, what we do uh, day to day. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Meyer. Thanks. Um, in addition to what Councillor Moore mentioned uh, regarding the networking, I also attended a few sessions that I, I thought were really um, really great and some information to bring, to bring back. Um, one of them was the inclusion and diversity panel. A um, couple highlights of that, um, or you know, some kind of quotes that, that stuck with me were um, that a diverse community breeds breeds innovation and an economic advantage. Um, so you know, having all those perspectives at the table is really important, obviously. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and equity is a, a side component of this, is that supporting people with diverse needs, um, it's not giving them an advantage, but it's to equal the field and to give fair opportunities. So um, some interesting uh, comments on that. And um, uh, one that says, you know, if you look in your community, look around to see who's at the table and who is not. If you see someone not there, go find them um, to go seek out um, the, the people that, that you're not seeing there um, and, and get their perspectives. Um, another session I went to was on cost escalations. Um, I was hoping for some like magic and I did not get it. Um, but as we know, we haven't seen this kind of volatility in over 30 years, it's a perfect storm. And, and as we know, things like quotes are only good for like seven or 10 days. Um, they talked about um, some advice they had with uh, building projects and I believe it was a design construction was the, the, the one that they're kind of looking, gearing towards, I'm not, a construction person so it's hard to keep track of that terminology but um my understanding was that um previously people would you know create a project and they would um pinpoint every last detail and it makes it really hard to be flexible during the middle of it so they're saying kind of go the opposite of that is that kind of say what you want but leave those details till you actually need to make those decisions on details um, because maybe the price of the goods have changed and you can find something that is more economical and, and kind of to be really, really flexible with that and open-minded. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting as, as, as we look forward um, to the multiplex. And another session was the future of transportation and impacts to uh, municipalities. Um, this is regarding um, like net zero and, and um, uh, EV vehicles and autonomous vehicles as well, um, that uh, huge changes need to be made. Um, uh, they're obviously incredibly expensive. Um, in the short term, there's likely been an increase in prices um, because there's no support 
um, from the government for this type of um, connection challenges that we're seeing with um, uh, electricity lines, especially transmission lines. And, um, and there's no motivation from those companies to uh, improve the existing electrical grid infrastructure from the distribution companies. Um, and the, the example they gave was if there's already a power pole there, um, they need a really big nudge to upgrade that power pole and, and the lines above it, I guess. Um, there's no financial motivator for them. So, um, so there's likely some huge challenges um, in the next decade uh, regarding that. Um, and that transportation of the future requires more smart cities and broadband is integral to this. I thought that was an interesting component to transportation um, because I've never really considered it that way. Um, and as Councillor Moore mentioned, uh, me meeting with the minister, um, the health minister copying. So I'm not sure if he's still the minister, but um, it was great. So. Questions call on Mr. Mayor. Um, another great conference, great to uh, have everybody together again. Um, I think the, the most important part was just connecting with people. Um, you know, talking to some mayors from larger, slightly larger communities than ours and slightly smaller communities than ours facing homelessness challenges. We're all in the same boat, all with the same problems. Um, and then of course we had our meeting with Minister Luan, uh, which was very encouraging. He's very in tune to the challenges we face in Edson and uh, rural Alberta. And uh, we were able to actually catch up with his chief of staff as well. And he's probably spent 45 minutes to an hour uh, on a, an official meeting. Um, and I think that has served us well because we have been allocated funds through an emergency winter uh, program uh, this year and next year, uh, which should help um, with, uh, with the situation with homelessness in our community. It's not the be all end all, but it's certainly a huge step forward uh, with the big plan that the government announced. And uh, ourselves, along with communities such as Metasquin and Slate Lake have been very vocal um, and um, very engaged on this issue. And I think that has helped the provincial government realize that this is not an issue just facing um, the large urban centers, it's facing uh, rural Alberta as well. Um, so I, I was very encouraged by that meeting. Uh, we got not very often you get 45 minutes and then we had an additional 45 minutes with the chief of staff. So, um, and uh, the, the meeting with Minister uh, Copping as well, about EMS challenges, um, he seemed to be very in tune with uh, with the challenges we're seeing, and uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, they're already talking about things such as uh, transportation of patients, um, where EMS is not required. Maybe they have uh, uh, a different crew doing those kind of transfers, so we're not taking paramedics off the roads. Um, I thought it was a really really good conference. The Resolution sessions are always interesting. Um, and uh, the key thing as well that I've never really seen, I've been to a lot of Alberta municipalities conferences, is how united all municipal most municipalities are on the RCMP and provincial police force issue. Um, I've never seen municipalities be that on board on, on one single issue before. So, um, so we'll see what happens uh, moving forward regarding that file. But, uh, it was great to get together and see some of our regional uh, partners there as well and have dinner with our MLA and, and be able to, to converse with them as well. Okay, Councillor Taylor. Uh, <clears throat> you need uh, an actual projector? And hold oh, yeah, uh, we'll do that later. Um, so, yeah, so the networking was fantastic. This is my first uh, AM conference. So, uh, the network is fantastic and lots of municipalities coming up to us asking about what we're dealing with homelessness of like the shelter pods initiative and we were able to have some, some good frank discussions with them about some of the solutions that we found and some of the challenges that we have and hearing that we're also not not alone in these issues right and uh, of course people mentioned the, the meetings with the ministers and i thought the meeting with the uh, minister of community social services was uh, extraordinarily successful that uh, he gave us 45 minutes and he also he already knew of our issues which I thought was fantastic right is that and you knew kind of what was coming um, and that's the thank of this council of mayors of Hera and CEO beverage the work that you've done laying the groundwork so that we could be on their radar uh, not only just for the meeting but for, for funding right and that's 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 excellent so um, some of the sessions I went to, I went to one on uh, the, the dangers of social media and the pitfalls of social media uh, from an elected 
uh, representative's perspective. And they threw out some issues and it was kind of funny in it is that then they had an open mic and when you allow politicians up to an open mic, you get it. Uh, which is great, uh, which is great to understand. Uh, but also the things I took within that that I could bring back to the way I use social media and how, you know, what we should be doing with it. And, um, and then Councillor Byer and I went on the cost inflation session and uh, my understanding of it is here and they spoke about it here and I left not understanding it. But, uh, but um, Councillor Byer did indicate that to have that flexibility, right? Not only the multiplex project that we're working on, but this is work I'm gonna take back to the lab report as well. In terms of their project, don't get locked in on things. I thought the um, keynote speaker on branding was, was great. Uh, taking that to my other line of work and uh, love the session on inclusivity as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a topic within this council that's sort of come up sort of informally and, and it's sort of brought up within our strategic plan for sure on inclusivity uh, and how to make sure we have, you know, the right kind of perspectives at the table, right? Um, uh, and I think that is everything. And so much of this stuff not only relates to this job, but also to my other jobs. So it's good. Yeah, no problem. It was a good conference. Um, it was nice to see that not all resolutions were show us the money. Um, it was nice to see that they weren't all rubber stamped. So we had some close resolutions. One was defeated because it didn't apply to municipalities and the, the crowd saw it the way it is. Um, it's nice to see that uh, most municipalities still view summer villages the same way. Um, <laughs> they... Uh, a couple of things to point out. I, 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 I found that like the trade show was a trade show. It's, it's just pretty much the same every time. Um, I did really enjoy the premier's um, outgoing speech, for lack of better terms. Um, his openness and insightfulness to uh, how we should do things was interesting. Um, and I really thought it was a, it so much doesn't apply to Edson, but one of his statements about the progress to get the planes back so that the government can get out into Peru, Alberta. Um, was an interesting statement to make um, on that. So um, I also discovered there's a lot of uh, a lot of faces that I recognized, and um, a lot of people like me that are recycled mayors that became councillors. So I was sort of surprised by how many. But you know, well, you're a councillor too. Me too. So that was uh, was interesting, and I was shocked on the on the uh, add to everybody else's statements on the homelessness conversations you have with so many people and. Um, and we're definitely knowing about what's been happening in this community. People ask how it goes, and um, so we definitely we see our challenges. But overall, I think it was a good conference. Um, it was uh, uh, it was monitored well, and, and for the most part, I think it was good. Okay, we'll say mine for last. Um, I would echo what most people in the the room said, like the resolutions, the premiers. I also was great. Um, what I enjoyed, we met with ministers and I enjoyed going to the bear pit and be able to talk to ministers for a question, justice minister, transportation minister, I couldn't find, but municipal affairs. So a lot of times it's the one-on-one -on -one when you can actually ask them the question. So no use re repeating what I would echo most. I met with them. The most exciting thing is, is because this is their second one after COVID and it was nice to see people face to face and meet them like some of the other councillors said it was echoing. It's not just Edson's problem. And I do agree. The biggest thing was homelessness and lots of questions about how is Edson doing it. Um, the interesting conversation I had with the town of Wetaskiwin said, be careful, don't build it too good or they will send them to you is some of the problems they have. But other than that, I enjoyed the conference and I guess that's it for my report. Okay, uh, Steve, do we have any moving on questions from media? Anyone public? Mr. Chair, we do have Mickey on the line. Hi, no questions. Okay, well then moving on, there's no closed session, so motion for adjournment. Mr. Chair, I think we should just continue talking for another 17 minutes. Uh, I have no problem with that. Do you want me to review the report? <laughs> 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 motion, okay, well, what was that, Councilor Moore? Councilor Taylor. All those in favor? Carried. Motion 